Okay, I could preface this with, with <laughs> this. Um, if you didn't do as well as you wanted to on the ER exam, don't stress, it's the first exam. ER was actually my lowest exam grade of last term. So, if you like me, hopefully. Wait, it was mine to... too, now that I think about go. it. So, yeah. that being said, um, you know, there's, there's room to make it up. So the thing about the DM module is that it's a little bit longer. So my advice would be to try to keep up with the material as best as possible, because as you move along, um, there's no really, there's no real time to make up. Not that there ever is, but um, D, DM is one of those things. So you need to find a way to keep the older material fresh but also keep up with the materials. So make sure you try to work that into your schedule. But we definitely understand it's a very dense module. So we're gonna do our best to uh, point out some things that we found helpful. Um, let's see, I'll go ahead and share the screen. Okay, hopefully y'all were able to get it. I had some technical difficulties uploading it. But uh, it should be up and ready to go. So um, Lindsay's gonna go over metabolism, then we'll take a break and then we'll go through all of the uh, anatomy and stuff. But I have a little intro for you. So me and Lindsay differ a little bit here. She's a big whiteboarder. She likes doing all the pathways in lots of colors. I am adamant about not memorizing things. The more I can understand, the less I have to memorize, right? When I get stressed, the stuff I understand sticks. The stuff I have to memorize fades away. So uh, my the way I learned this is I very much focused on the in the rate limiting enzymes and the enzymes that were disease oriented. Those steps, okay. I knew glycolysis. I knew the Krebs cycle. That's about it, right? Other than that, all the other pathways, I focused on you know the important steps. Okay, so that was my thought process. I know Lindsay does have a similar, obviously the, the rate limiting enzymes and stuff uh, are important, but she's a big whiteboarder, so she can conceptualize it uh, better that way. So whatever works for you, but I would say uh, it's much more important to focus on the clinical aspects than it is to focus on being able to whiteboard the whole pathway. Okay, so my page, Lindsay's page. We put some good stuff on here. I put my consolidated notes for the exam. They're broken up by week. So you can look at those old test questions, stuff like that, or old uh, practice questions. All right, so I'm gonna do a little brief overview. Uh, hopefully this could kind of uh, introduce you into the more detailed stuff that Lindsay's gonna go into. So some of the terminology, um, if you get this down, it'll be, it'll be easier. Kinases are going to add a phosphate group. Uh, phosphatases will remove a phosphate group. Those are gonna be our main players here. But some of the other ones that just help me out to remember, remember carboxylase always uses biotin as a cofactor. It's one of those things they ask. And if you ever see carboxylase, it's always gonna use biotin. Some of these aren't it's super important, but uh, just a general understanding uh, will help you answer some of the test questions that uh, will be third and fourth order. Okay, so as I pointed out, this is a lot of nitty gritty stuff. I don't like memorizing all of it. So what do you need to focus on? Like I said, the rate limiting enzyme, those, those enzymes that are unidirectional, right? So a lot of, even, even when we talk about glycolysis, right? And gluconeogenesis, so, so the, there's three steps in glycolysis that are very unique and four steps in gluconeogenesis that are unique. They're unidirectional. That's because the body, the, system, the way the body works is that it's a, you're flipping a switch. You're either gonna break down glucose or you're gonna make it. There's no gradient, right? And these rate limiting enzymes or these unidirectional enzymes are like a one-way door or like a turnstile, right? Once you start going down the path of saying, I'm breaking down the glucose, you're not going backwards, okay? So that's why they put these individual enzymes or the body's made to put these enzymes there because once, once insulin's there, we're breaking it down, right? We, we don't wanna go back up the pathway. So, and we'll, we'll, look, at, we'll look at that a little bit uh, further along. But so those are going to be the important points, right? Those are the, the checkpoints. Those are the places where you can use medication. Those are places where disease tend to crop up. So um, keep that in mind. Okay, 
So it gets a little bit more detailed in this uh, when it comes to the rate limiting enzymes. Like for example, I was saying for uh, glycolysis, there are three, you know, glucokinase, PFK, one and um, pyruvate kinase, right? But if you want a general understanding, like some of these, like when you get down here, uh, when we get to those uh, later on, you know, these are gonna be your rate limiting, the most important enzymes and the regulators, of course. What you'll find is a lot of the regulation is downstream, right? So if you have a lot of ATP, you're not gonna really focus on breaking down glucose too much, right? So it's gonna feed back, the ATP is gonna feed back to the glucose and say, we have enough energy. So you'll see that, especially with PFK1, you could see that some of the downstream players, ATP is going to uh, um, feedback, inhibit it. And then uh, fructose 2, 6 bisphosphate, we'll get to that bad boy in a second. We're gonna do the, the bifunctional enzyme. Um, so like I said, I knew glycolysis and TCA. Other than that, I focused more on the uh, important steps. Okay, so this is how we're gonna break it down. So when we think of insulin, we're gonna think of it as an on switch. And I tried to illustrate this in my slides, right? So insulin, think of the on switch as you, you're just being uh, in, in the fed state, right? So what, what the, and then glucagon is gonna be the off switch. So it's all or nothing, right? There's no gradient. We're either going to lower the blood glucose or we're gonna increase the blood glucose. We're gonna either store glucose or we're gonna be making glucose. So it's always a switch. So I like to think of, all of the players for insulin on a team and all of the players for glucagon on another team, right? They're, they're, it's all or nothing. You're either using one pathway or you're using the other. And if you keep those in mind, it'll be easy on the test to try to differentiate what we're doing. Cause they'll say a person just ate and you can eliminate three of the five choices because they're talking about the fasting state, okay? Now, what this means is if this switches on insulin, you're in the fed state, right? you're gonna be focusing on lowering your blood glucose. That's gonna in, in, uh, in incorporate storing glucose and breaking down glucose. Now, as it works out is that the enzymes are gonna be dephosphorylated. If, if the enzymes that are on insulin's team are dephosphorylated, they're gonna be activated. It works out perfectly because that's kind of like our on switch. That's telling this dephosphorylated state is telling the enzymes that are involved in the insulin pathway or the breaking down of glucose, that's telling them to go ahead and work, right? That's telling them to be activated, right? So, and then phosphatase is gonna be that enzyme that dephosphorylates um, the enzyme, right? It's gonna be the enzyme that dephosphorylates the enzyme to turn it on. I know that's a lot of words. Now, glucagon is going to be the opposite. So we're flipping the switch off. So we're in the fasting state. This is say, so these enzymes, when they're active, they know to work by, by being phosphorylated, okay? So insulin, when these enzymes are active, these enzymes are dephosphorylated. When glucagon, the enzymes for, gluc uh, for glucagon are phosphorylated, that tells them to be active. So if you have all these enzymes floating around, the idea of them being dephosphorylated is gonna tell them to break stuff, break glucose down, store glucose. If they're phosphorylated, we're trying to increase glucose, blood glucose. It gets a little bit more complicated than this, but um, this is kind of how I try to uh, understand it. Okay, so some of the regula regulatory enzymes, for, and a lot of this stuff is from first aid. I find DM, the stuff in first aid for DM is really good. So these are, these are our, you see they're unidirectional, right? They, they're not bidirectional. That means they're important. They're only involved in glycolysis. So you can see glucokinase or hexokinase, depending on if you're in the liver, or if you're in the muscle, uh, it's gonna be important. Also phosphofructokinase, PFK1 is important. It's unidirectional. And pyruvate kinase is also unidirectional. So you need to know which ones require ATP, which ones produce ATP. They're producing ATP by substrate level phosphorylation. Just the terminology of uh, the substrates being able to produce ATP. Okay, so these are three hexokinase or glucokinase, PFK1, pyruvate kinase are going to be those three enzymes. But also you need to know that uh, phosphoglycerate kinase and pyruvate kinase are gonna be in the steps where you make ATP. Okay, so the process, uh, when we get through glycolysis 
anaerobically at least, um, we're going to make four ATP, but we have to use two. So the product is gonna be a positive two, okay? You also make NADH that you can feed into the, uh, the different shuttling systems, but um, just for anaerobically, we're gonna have a total of two that we're gonna make. Okay, so again, these are gonna be important enzymes. And again, these are unidirectional, so they're gonna drive this pathway. You know, once you go past them, you can't go backwards. So we're gonna be breaking down glucose. So again, you see the little switch here, so we're on. That means we're on the insulin pathway. All right, so let's flip it, right? So now we're off. So we're in the fasting state. So we're gonna go through the gluconeogenesis pathway. These are the four enzymes you're gonna to wanna to remember. Why are they important? Well, they're unidirectional, right? That's the theme. If they're unidirectional, they're pushing one way and they're not gonna let you go backwards. So it's like a turnstile, as I said. So these enzymes are gonna be important to make glucose, right? Gluconeogenesis, right? The formation of new glucose. So these are gonna be the four that you're gonna to need to remember. Again, carboxylases, remember they require biotin. One of the interesting or the uh, things that stands out is that part of the uh, carboxylase is actually in the mitochondria, which is that first step to, for gluconeogenesis. So you need to know these four steps. All right, everybody take a deep breath. We're gonna learn this right now. All right, so this is very busy. But the way you can think of this little system, this bifunction enzyme, is a way, it's, it's, it's an additional way to fine tune the glucose levels in the body, okay? So this is very busy for me, so we're gonna break it down. So if we do this first, okay. So insulin, right, we're on, so we're the insulin, the insulin pathway. So, that means the enzymes that are working are dephosphorylated. That doesn't mean they're phosphorylases, right? They're, they, just these enzymes are dephosphorylated, okay? So PFK1 and PFK2 are dephosphorylated, making them active, okay? Now, the reason I said think kinases is because for this specific process, the kinases are gonna be what we're gonna be looking at to break it down. So all this is saying is that when you have, when you're, when the, when the switch is on, when insulin is active, we're driving towards breaking down glucose. So not only can we say PFK1 is going to break fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Let me just point this out just, just real quick. Bis is means two, right? So anytime you have a bisphosphate, you should have two numbers with it. So keep that in mind. Bisphosphate means two numbers, always phosphate, there'll be one. Okay, so we wanna also not only just go through the pathway of breaking down fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, we also wanna say, we wanna ramp it up, okay? So by ramping it up, we can also make fructose 2,6-bisphosphate from fructose 6-bisphosphate from this portion of the bifunctional enzyme. And what fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is gonna do is upregulate PFK1. So this path pathway, fructose 6 to fructose 1,6 is gonna be upregulated. So anytime you have increased levels of fructose 2,6 bisphosphate, you're gonna be pushing it this way, okay? Now, the opposite we can look at. So this is the same thing, just the opposite. So now let's say the switch is off we're trying to increase our blood glucose. So we're going through the glucagon pathway. Now, what's gonna happen is you would expect to have low levels of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate because this bifunctional enzyme switched, just like the switch, right? It switched from breaking down glucose to uh, wanting to form glucose. So now we're using the uh, fructose bisphosphatase. Okay, so again, it's a two. Remember, and this was a two is the extra one, and this is a two in this extra pathway. So if we're, if we're making new glucose, you would expect to have low levels of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. And that's because this portion of the bifunctional enzyme, fruct uh, fructose bisphosphatase two, is gonna be active. And what it's gonna do is break down this fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. 
right? And by doing that, we're gonna help push towards gluconeogenesis. So one of the big questions they're gonna ask is related to fructose 2, 6 bisphosphate. If it's increased, we're going this way, right? We're, we're upregulating PFK1. If it's decreased, that means fructose bisphosphatase is active and we're going, we're going to have lower levels of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. And so we're going to be pushing towards gluconeogenesis. You kind of just need to sit with it and talk about it. But by all means, keep the players together, right? Keep these kinases with the process of, of making or breaking down glucose and keep these phosphatases together with uh, making new glucose, okay? They're gonna have questions on it. A lot of it's related to uh, the substrate here. Okay, now this is a little bit more of it. Remember this switch that we're talking about is just actually on the enzyme, right? What, so would you expect fructose bisphosphatase two to be dephosphorylated or phosphorylated? Well, it's, it's part of the glucagon pathway, right? So it should be phosphorylated to make it active. If you're thinking, would PFK2 or PFK1 be phosphorylated or dephosphorylated? It's on insulin, right? So for it to work, it needs to be dephosphorylated. So remember, insulin's D, phosphorylated, glucagon's phosphorylated. It's just saying whether the enzyme's on or off. No, that's a difficult topic. Um, we can go over it again later if, uh, if y'all want to. All right, so this is kind of just in words what I was saying. Um, remember these kinases are gonna go be dephosphorylated through the insulin pathway. And these uh, uh, bisphosphatases um, are, are gonna be on the glucagon pathway and they're gonna be phosphorylated. Okay, now what's interesting about the PDH complex is mostly these enzymes here. So remember, once we get to pyruvate, we're kind of at that, what that standstill, right? Either we're gonna go to lactate through the anaerobic pathway, or we're gonna go all the way through, if we can, through the aerobic pathway. So it's kind of like that branching point. So the mnemonic TLC for Nancy, it's, you gotta remember these. These are the cofactors that are involved. You also wanna remember besides PDH, alpha ketoglutarate, and y'all will get to branch chain ketoacid dehydrogenase. Those are all, have these. So you probably have multiple questions relating to these coenzymes. All right, let's see. Okay, and then this is kind of how this will work. You do need to know all the steps in the TCA cycle and what comes off, where the NADH has come off, where the GTP is made, where the FADH2 is made, um, and kind of be able to work out the math. But beyond the glycolysis and TCA cycle, um, just knowing those main enzymes and the cofactors involved, you should be fine. Okay, and what I just wanted to point out for the ETC, the drugs are super important here. Knowing the details of all this, if you had a general understanding of what goes through the different complexes, that's fine. But uh, I remember being highly tested on the different drugs and what complexes uh, they work on. But the whole point here is we wanna make a gradient, right? So the whole point through here is to make a gradient to where we have a bunch of hydrogens on one side and so that we can push those hydrogens down its concentration gradient and spin this, this wheel, right? And by spinning this wheel, we're gonna make ATP. It's pretty fancy, um, but the way these drugs work is that um, they can stop it at different points. They can even, even stop this complex like oligomycin and there's some other drugs that are also used. So this is actually from, uh, just because the, the ones in first data are slightly different, but uh, this is more complete. This is from your lecture. And then there's some other ones too that you need to know. So um, uh, one of the problems is that once you uh, start making ATP, you need, to, you need to shuttle it back across the membrane. So some of these affect this, uh, this pathway as well. And then there's some uncouplers. Um, one of the things that thermogen Thermogenin is actually used as a weight loss supplement. So the idea is that you can actually constantly be, so, okay. So you make this gradient, this hydrogen gradient, but instead of the hydrogen pumping through to make ATP, it just goes back across the membrane, right? So it kind of skips this, it skips this part, this complex five, and it just, it just goes across the membrane. So you're constantly producing heat 
you're making a cycle where you produce heat, but you're not making ATP. So actually that's how brown fat works in babies as well. It's, uh, and so you keep uh, making heat, but you're not producing ATP. So you're able to burn fat. Um, that just helps me remember it. So aspirin and that 2,4-dinitrophenol uh, are some of those uncouplers. Uh, Ionophor is similar concept. You make an ion channel through it. So you can pump the hydrogen through and then um, the uncoupler. So just knowing where these work will be uh, good enough for the exam. Okay, and then we'll get into glycogen when we do the glycogen storage diseases, but I'm gonna pass it over to Lindsay so she can go through this in more detail. Okay, so, um, so some tips for metabolism, get a general understanding of all the pathways and their functions. You do need to understand it. You do need to understand what's going on. Again, like Brady said, you need to pay special attention to any enzyme that is regulated or has disease implications because that is very testable because they can give you a patient where something is changed, something is different, and you have to know where in the metabolic roadmap that is occurring. Reversible versus irreversible, um, this is very important. And then upregulated versus downregulated. Um, and know the major enzymes for each pathway. That first aid um, chart that he showed you guys had the rate limiting enzymes, memorize it. Every single thing on there, memorize it because um, if you can write all of those enzymes on a card and just mix them up, shuffle them up and look at the enzyme and know what pathway it is, you're in a really good spot just for understanding the metabolic map. But um, that is my recommendation to you. You can go to the next slide, I think. So like Brady said, I love whiteboarding. I only whiteboard it once. So a lot of people will whiteboard until they can draw the pathway from memory. That's not what I do. So here is exactly what I did for biochem. I watched the Ninja Nerd videos because I love Ninja Nerd and I mapped it out. And then I went to the SGU lectures and I filled in the little details that SGU wants to know. And then of course I take pictures of all my whiteboarding. Um, glycolysis and TCA, I would know every single step, just um, that's good. The rest of them, like Brady said, every single step is not necessarily the most important. But I whiteboard it once, I fill in the details, I get the general understanding, and then I go in and I look at all of the highly regulated areas, how it's um, turned on, how it's turned off, and that's how I get the understanding, that's how I understand it. Um, and so if any of you guys want my DM whiteboarding, I could definitely send it to you. Um, you can try to decipher my craziness. But if you like whiteboarding, um, I thought it was really good. But remember, I only whiteboard the pathway out once and then I focus on what's important in the pathway. I don't, I don't whiteboard it over and over and over again until I can do it without something um, helping me. So we can get to the next slide. So we're going to start with glycolysis and the pentose phosphate pathway. So just so you know, I kind of, I took things from lectures and I put them in different spots because of course, you know, it gets a little repetitive. So I put, I tried not to be repetitive and I am focusing on what I think you guys should spend a lot of time on. So definitely look over all of the material that SGU gives you, but I want to present you with things that I think are a little more difficult and that you really need to spend some time on. So the first one, um, you need, so stay on this for a second, sorry. <laughs> um, you need to know the main function and location of every single pathway. Um, the function really is just for your own edification so you can understand the metabolic map. Um, so for glycols and stuff like that that we've been doing since undergrad, the function like you already know, but when you get into beta oxidation of medium chain, long chain fatty acids, all of those things, it gets a little more important because those aren't things we haven't done to a greater extent before medical school. So pay attention to the main function and then of course where it's located, that can get important too. Okay, so this is the summary of, glyco of glycolysis. So 
Um, I'm not gonna go over this in super, super detail, but I am gonna point out that you do need to know the regulated steps of substrate level phosphorylations. Um, know that in these, in um, these first initial steps, you have ATP usage. So you're putting energy into the system to make this go. And we'll talk about that when we go into the bioenergetic stuff. Um, it makes a little more sense why we have to get that ATP um, dephosphorylated here and break that high energy bond. But we'll talk about that later. I just wanted to show the summary because I'm not gonna show this again in the slides that I provided to you, but I just want you to see the overview, see the places where you need to focus your attention on. So the first thing is glucose trapping in the cell. So when you have glucose in your bloodstream, you have the GLUT 2s, you have the GLUT 4s, yes, you need to know those, and it gets into the cell, but glucose can still, it can go back and forth with some of those glutes. So you wanna trap it in the cell. So this first process from glucose to G6P, glucose 6-phosphate, is really just trapping that glucose in the cell. And so you can do that by glucokinase or hexokinase. You do need to know the difference between these two. This is extremely important. This is extremely high yield. I broke it down for you myself. So glucokinase is just in liver and pancreatic beta cells, higher KM, which means low binding aff affinity. What a higher KM means is that you have to have a lot of blood glucose for it to go. So high Vmax means a high capacity. So high capacity, but low binding affinity. So in the liver and pancreatic beta cells, you really do need a high blood glucose concentration for it to um, switch this on, switch this glucokinase on. Um, this is insulin dependent. So again, insulin um, gl blood glucose stimulates insulin release. And so this is, I believe if you watch the Nijiner videos, he does a really good job explaining exactly the process. Um, SGU doesn't um, attest you on it, so don't necessarily know the transcription and everything, um, unless it's in your slide, I can't remember. But, and then the mutation, of course, hyperglycemia and MODI, this is often tested. You need to know that this is a disease associated with glucokinase mutation. So glucokinase is a sensor and it controls the entry of glucose into the glycolytic pathway. But remember, only liver and pancreatic beta cells. Hexokinase is in all of your cells. It's a low KM, meaning even if there's just a small amount there, it's going to, um, hexokinase is going to be active, but of course, lower Vmax and uh, it's not gonna have as much capacity to um, go. But this is very important. Again, this is glucose trapping in side of the cell so that it can go down the rest of the glycolytic pathway. Um, so fates of G6P. So that for, I put this in here because um, I, I went out of order a little bit. I put this in here because I want you guys to understand that there are certain points in the metabolic map where it branches. And so you have glucose, so you have G6P because you trapped it inside the cell. G6P can go to multiple places. And so it can go to the pentose phosphate pathway, it can do um, glycolysis, glycogenesis. It has all of these pathways that it can go. And so depending on the conditions in the cell and your body knows what it needs. And so it's gonna switch certain things on, switch certain things off, just like Brady said. Um, so when we're talking about glycolysis, of course, it's gonna, the end is gonna be pyruvate. And then we'll talk about what can happen here. But just note that G6P is kind of a branching point within the glycolytic pathway. So um, that's really important. With the pentose phosphate pathway, I believe that's my next slide. Everything you need to know about the pentose phosphate pathway is on this slide. Um, if you do go to supplemental resources, if you go into osmosis, if you go into ninja nerds, it does a very good job of explaining the pentose phosphate pathway. However, what you need to know for your exam is basically on this slide. Of course, it's a cytosolic pathway, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. You guys learned about this in FT, um, no, it was CPR, like CPR one or two. That is very, 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 very important. Um, so if you see this enzyme, you know you're talking about the PPP. Um, forums NADPH, this is extremely important. There are only a couple places in your cell where you are going to get NADPH. So highlight this, star it, make a note of this because this is one of those big ones. Um, 
purine and pyrimidine synthesis, just know that this is involved in it. And then this is extremely high yield. Transketolase requires TPPP. A thymine deficiency means that this is going to be defective. So they love focusing on this transketolase requiring this vitamin, vitamin B1. And pause for a second, You anytime it mentions a cofactor, a vitamin, anything, you need to memorize it. You need to need to memorize it. Just assume that if they give you a cofactor or an enzyme, it will be tested. So make sure you understand those. Um, it's not that many if you actually put it on a page, but they are very important because those vitamins and cofactors can be deficient. And of course, that means enzymes are not working as they should. So please remember that again, pentose phosphate pathway, pretty much anything you need to know about it for this exam is on this slide. Um, and I think this is all they really go over in your slides, but um, you'll have a couple questions from here. But again, that is just one fate of G6P after glucose has been phosphorylated. Now, this is back to what um, Brady was talking about. I spent a lot of time trying to understand this. So the second important reaction is PFK1, Fox phosphofructokinase 1. So that's F6P to F16 by bisphosphate. So again, this is a switch between glycolysis and gluconeogenesis based on the needs of the cell. So I try to break it down very simply. And so I'm going to annotate this because I like drawing and I think it, that's why I like whiteboarding because it helps me, um, it helps me conceptual. Brady is laughing at me. I like, I love whiteboarding guys. Okay. So you have your glute, you have your glucose coming in here. It gets phosphorylated. So now you have G6P and then you get F6P, F6P. Now, as you're making F6P, if you have an abundance of F6P, that means you have a lot of glucose, right? Because if you are getting glucose into your cell and you are phosphorylating that glucose to trap it into the cell, and remember, G6P to F6P, it's not a regulated enzyme. It happens. It's, it doesn't need coupling. It doesn't need anything else. It just happens. So once you get G6P, if, if you're going down the glycolytic pathway, you're going to get F6P. So you're going to increase in F6P because you have an increased blood sugar. Now, a little bit of this F6P is going to go through this by... Um, bifunctional enzyme. So again, bifunctional enzyme, it's PFK2 and the F, I think in your notes, it calls it like this or something like that. I don't know, but that's your bifunctional enzyme. And this enzyme is going to give you F26 biphosphate. This enzyme right here, and that's not an enzyme, sorry guys, it's a molecule. So F6P increased because of the gly going down glycolytic pathway. This bifunctional enzyme is going to give you F26 bisphosphate. Now, PFK1, this is your glycolytic enzyme. Can everybody see this? I'm just running into my thing and it's getting a little, I'll make this darker. Yeah, you're good. Okay. F26 bisphosphate is going to go and it's going to activate PFK1. So basically what this is saying is, hey, we have a lot of blood sugar and we need to upregulate this enzyme because we got a lot of products coming through. We have to do some glycolysis. And so this is the same F6P that's in your glycolytic pathway, guys. It's no different. All The only thing that's different is this bifunctional enzyme is here and it's going to make your F2,6 bisphosphate. This is going to upregulate PFK1 so that you can go through the rest of glycolysis and you are going to end up with pyruvate. Now, this enzyme right here is regulated. It's heavily regulated based off of the needs of the cell. And if you have glucagon, remember that phosphorylates, insulin is going to dephosphorylate. And so 
it's going to do, glucagon is going to phosphorylate both of these, insulin is going to dephosphorylate both of these, but based off the characteristics of the enzyme, the phosphorylation versus dephosphorylation is going to change the action of the enzyme. So it's either going to activate or inhibit it. So again, like Brady said, think about it. If you are, um, if you have a lot of insulin because of blood sugar, PFK2 is going to be activated. PFK2 is the one actually responsible for making this F2,6 bisphosphate, whereas this F2,6 bisphosphatase, remember ACE, if, if it, it kind of has a name in here and the ACE for the enzyme, it means that it's breaking this down. That's how I remember it. So it, um, insulin, this is going to upregulate this glucagon. It's going to upregulate this. And if glucagon is upregulated, then the F2,6 bisphosphate is actually going to go back to F6 phosphate. Did that make sense? That's how PFK1 is either activated. Okay. But this is a very important enzyme. It's when you look at it, it takes like three or four slides to explain it. And I had to sit there and I had to, I, this is why I have this little sticky in it that I put on my whiteboard because I really had to break it down to its simplest form and understand it, like what was going on. Um, so this is probably something I would whiteboard over and over and over again until I got it. But um, it's it once you get it though, it's not as hard as it seems. I promise. It's not as hard as it seems when you sit if you work with it. But I've kind of broken it down. Yeah, Ninja Nerd was great at drawing this out. Um, so that's how I understood it. But I tried to break it down into a simplest form on this slide. But hope you guys can get it again. If you have any troubles, please let us know because this is one of those things that you need to have a good understanding of. And I'll just add, if it's still confusing to you guys, just start out by putting them on separate teams, right? Put them on the insulin team with the kinases and put them on, with the phosphatases on the uh, glucagon side and then work with that because th then at least you'll be able to answer the test questions because they're going to ask you if this is activated, if this is dephosphorylated, which way are you going? Okay, this is from your slides. I just wanted to put it on here for completion's sake. Um, again, this enzyme, bifunctional enzyme, phosphorylated by PKA, of course, you need to know that second messenger stuff if it mentions it because that is important. But again, I put this on it um, kind of for completion's sake and also to see some of the other regulations. So AMP, if you have increased AMP, that means there's decreased ATP. So you need glucose, you need ATP. And so it's going to go in the glycolytic pathway. But if you, so decreased blood sugar, if you have increased ATP, it means that you probably need some sugar. And so you're going to go up. So make sure you um, are paying attention to any of these regulators. Um, Okay, citrate inhibits this. Why? Because um, citrate is in the TCA. So if you have an abundance of, tea, of um, citrate, it means that we have enough. Essentially, it's saying, hey guys, there's enough here and you can stop now. And so citrate goes back up into the um, beginnings of the glycolytic pathway and it says, hey, stop. We don't need you anymore. Stop it. It's kind of, it's negative um, feedback. So. Okay, private message. There can be more than one in this question. So private message, Brady or myself. Yeah, pretty much everybody is getting this one right. You can go to the next slide, Brady. 
It is D and G. And so instead of um, going over this in depth again, I just wanted to do a little multiple choice question for you guys. Um, these are the substrate level phosphorylation. What does that mean? You're getting ATP from ADP. So the phosphorylation, that term substrate level phosphorylation means that you're adding a phosphate onto ADP. So you're getting that ATP. And so you got to know these. Um, you got to know which one's energy expenditure. You got to know what you get ATP from. So I just wanted to, it can be easy points on the exam. It's just, do you know it or do you not? Okay, put this on for kind of, for completion sake. Um, so we don't really have to go over this because you guys got that right. Okay. Now this slide I actually took from one of your later DLAs, but I really like this picture and I think it goes well um, in glycolysis because I want you guys to know the fates of pyruvate. Now, um, notice that I didn't go through all the steps of glycolysis. Um, you do need to know all the steps, but, uh, but the ones that I'm highlighting here, these are the ones that are more complicated. The others are pretty easy to get down if you draw it out a couple times, or even if you just look at it, you should know the steps of glycolysis. Um, but I think this is more important to spend our time on right now. Pyruvate has multiple fates. It can go in multiple places. We Everybody knows about acetyl-CoA going into the TCA. Um, you've heard about lactate because of um, um, exercise and you build up lactic acid. Um, but then you also have oxaloacetate and alanine. So these two, the transamination and carboxylation are going to get more in depth later on and like next week in um, rep for the exam. But I wanted you guys to see that pyruvate has many ways it can go. But also know which ones are reversible, which ones are irreversible or, or unidirectional, bidirectional, that's very important. So the next slide, I believe, yes. So this is the regulation, pyruvate kinase. Again, this is substrate level phosphorylation. You are getting ATP from this. So this is going from F, um, you are getting pyruvate in this reaction. So it's a feed forward activator, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Remember, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate was way up at the beginning with PFK1. Why is this important? Because if you're building up these intermediates, it basically sends it down the line and prepares downstream enzymes. Like, hey guys, get ready. You're having some um, enzymes coming to you. You're having some molecules coming to you. So that's what um, this means. You're just getting everyone down the line ready so that when it gets there, there's not a stall, which is a really um, corny way of saying it and not biochemical at all, but um, it can help you conceptualize it. Um, phosphorylation decreases activity. So just remember what phosphorylation is. <laughs> and then, um, okay, alanine is substrate for gluconeogenesis. We're going to go over this when we go over um, gluconeogenesis because this is actually a big one for gluconeogenesis, but it inhibits pyruvate kinase. But that makes sense, right? Because if you're looking at the players on the team, if, if um, glucagon has its players and insulin has its players, if this is for gluconeogenesis and we want to go through the glycolytic pathway to get um, ATP, from the um, electrotransport chain, you don't want it to go back up to give you glucose. So alanine, which is a substrate for gluconeogenesis, is going to inhibit pyruvate kinase. So this is this is talking about um, this is not in the glycolytic TCA pathway. So that's just an inhibitor. Now. If we're talking about lactic acid formation, this is a big long slide with a lot of words. The biggest thing here is what's bolded. Lactate levels, um, oh, I apologize. The one before it, resulting in a high NADH to NAD plus ratio. Star this, highlight it, make a note of it. This is the most important um, push towards lactic acid formation. So once you get to pyruvate, if you have an increase of um, NADH, that ratio, then you're going to, it's going to push you towards um, lac, um, lactate. But if the ratio is switched, you have higher NAD, then it's going to push you towards the TCA cycle. 
So make sure you know that. Um, that's very important. It will probably be tested. But conceptually, though, it makes sense because if the TCA is increasing, if you have a lot of TCA activity, it means you're getting a lot of NADH because NADH is a, is a um, big product of the TCA cycle. So if you're getting a lot of TCA, you have a lot of NADH, a lot of NADH, it builds up and says, hey, stop it. We have enough. Here you go. Or on the other um, side of that, if you're exercising, you get to a point where you're anaerobic. So you can't go through the electron transport chain. You get that buildup of NADH because it's not transferring its electrons to the electron transport chain. And that's why you're getting lactate. Yeah, next slide. Now, Cori cycle. Why do we care about lactate? This is it. The Cori cycle is the purpose of this is to get gluconeogenesis pro, um, substrates to the um to the liver so you get buildup of lactate in the muscles so you're getting anaerobic you're getting that increase of nadh because it's not going to the electron transport chain it pushes the pyruvate to the lactate dehydrogenase um, cycle and then you get this buildup of lactate lactate goes into the blood it goes to the liver and lactate is going to be used in gluconeogenesis so increasing blood sugar when you need it that's what the Cori cycle is. That's basically the gist of it. Um, you do need to know the overall concept of it, the overall pathway, but don't, I spent a lot of time because I didn't understand what the Cori cycle was. It was just some random thing that was stuck into the metabolic map and I didn't understand it. But if you just break it down, simplistic sake, this just, it's for gluconeogenesis, lactate is a substrate for that, then it becomes um, a little easier. Okay, so the energetics, um, they want you to know the difference between the two, anaerobic versus aerobic. So look over this, don't spend all of your time on this, but you do need to understand the difference between anaerobic and aerobic, um, what you're getting from each. Uh, just a quick question. I, I kind of forgot why we, do we get only ATP in, in aerobic? In the aerobic, anaerobic, and and aerobic, we only get a total of two ATPs. But like yesterday, I encountered, encountered it, but I forgot why. And I was wondering the, if, yeah. So, um, in your anaerobic pathway, it means you don't have oxygen. Now, when we go through the electron transport chain, you're going to learn that oxygen is the final acceptor of electrons. And so if you don't have oxygen, you don't have that final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain, meaning you're not getting that ATP because that's the whole process there. Oxygen is the final acceptor, that gradient is set up, and then ATP um, synthase, I think that's what it's called, uh, does its thing. But if you don't have oxygen as a terminal acceptor, you get all this buildup of NADH, but you're not getting ATP because the trans, um, the electrons aren't um, transferred to the electron transport chain. So you're getting all that buildup of NADH, but you're not getting that ATP. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the only two ATPs you get is from the, uh, uh, the glycolysis rate. Yeah. Oh, awesome, thanks. Yeah. And re remember the, the, the thing is you do make that NADH, right? But you don't have, there's no mitochondria. So you can't use that malate aspartate shuttle to get the NADH in. So you do have excess NADH, but because you don't have the mitochondria, you can't use that shuttle. So you can't actually make additional uh, in, uh, ATP from it. So sometimes you'll see that you get net two, but if you do have aerobic glycolysis, uh, those um, those NADHs can be incorporated. So to give you like six to eight total. So, but the problem is you don't have a mitochondria, so it doesn't, uh, it won't go through. Yeah, for red blood cells and stuff, for tissues that don't have mitochondria, like they're only sources that um, they're only ATP sources from glycolysis because they don't have the mitochondria. But for, for example, like skeletal muscle during exercise, when you get to an, because you first, first you're aerobic and then you get to be anaerobic um, longer exercise and then it pushes to the lactic acid buildup. And so, I mean, you have the tissues without 
um, mitochondria and then you have the tissues with mitochondria, but it's basically the same thing. You don't have that final electron um, acceptor. You don't have the ETC. And so it gets pushed towards lactate and the only energy production you're getting is from the glycolytic pathway. And Yasmin made a really good point in the chat. Um, it's also because NADH it pushes towards lactate. Lactate is used for gluconeogenesis, which also uses energy. So, um, but if we're just talking about the glycolytic pathway, we are only looking at, um, at the glycolysis. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, I have so, a quick question. Yeah. Um, so for the it for the glycolysis, right at the end. So for the ATP amount that we get, either six or eight, does that depend on the shadow the shadow that is used? That's why. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so defects in muscle glycolysis. Let's see what I meant to put on here. Oh, this is kind of an introduction to your um, glycogen storage diseases. I wanted to put this on here to kind of introduce that. You will get to it next week, I believe, because you, you're you muted. They, they did it on Friday, but I'm gonna cover it later on. Oh, okay. But yeah, you, you could introduce it with the uh, McArdle. Okay. So muscle cramps during high intensity anaerobic exercise, this is a characteristic of a certain disease and he just said it was McArdle. Um, so this says myoglobinuria, high serum CKMM. So this would be your lab results that you're going to find. No increase in blood lactate levels. Um, so I wanted to put this on here to introduce that because it follows in this lecture. But um, I, if you're going to look at information, this is not the slide to look at because this is a general overview. When you get to the glycogen storage diseases, that's when you really need to pay attention. This is sort of an introduction for you guys. Arsenic poisoning, this is one of the things that they can throw in there because it can affect different levels of the glycolytic pathway. And so make sure you understand where it can go in and affect it. And if you affect, remember, if you affect something, if you infect, it affect an enzyme, can't talk guys, then all of the intermediates before it are going to build up and stuff can happen when that builds up. Lactic acidosis can cause high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Remember that because if they start, if they ask you what kind of um, uh, imbalance, you, it, this can be an easy point on your exam if you understand it and you get it, but make sure you do know it. Um, the stuff down here, conditions of lactic acidosis, I spent a really long time trying to understand everything with respect to the high NADH um, ratio and what that means in the map. Um, you can too. It, it actually wasn't tested at that high of a level on our exam, but they could do it for you guys. But the big thing is this ratio right here, but this is very common in alcohol consumption. So alcohol, you get that increased um, NADH to NAD ratio. Okay, regulation of these enzymes. Um, these are the big three and we just went over the big three. Make sure you know how they are regulated. Okay, structure and function of carbohydrates. I put the slides on here that I personally feel you should focus on. Um, definitely, I didn't put everything on here, but I wanted to highlight some things that I remember being important. So just a disclaimer, I did not put all of it on here. I just put what I feel is important. But you should definitely look at all of it for completion's sake. But, um, yeah, so you can go to the next one. So you need to know what a reducing sugar is. You need to know what a reducing sugar is because they will talk about it in the question stem. So they'll say a reducing sugar is found in the urine that is not um, glucose or something like that. And you have to know what these reducing sugars are. So sugar is not found in the urine. These um, 
So these are of clinical significance. If you find one of these in the urine, something went wrong. And so of course this um, slide is just a preview. When you go into the actual diseases, they will talk about what you will find. So this is more of an overview to understand that this is not normal. You should not see these sugars in the urine. Polyols, um, sorbitol versus galactosol. You need to know the difference between these two. So um, does anybody, so aldose reductase is, it's the same enzyme. It's the same enzyme for both of these pathways, sorbitol versus galactosol. It just depends on if you're doing um, glucose or if you're doing galactose. And so, um, galactosol is indicated in some of um, in uh, galactose, what word am I trying to look for? Intolerances, there we go. Galactose intolerances. And so you get a galactosemia and you get galactosol versus sorbitol. I made this mistake on my exam because I saw the buzzword and I just put something, but I put the wrong one. So please don't make that same mistake. Please don't make that same mistake. Um, but this uses the same enzyme, aldose reductase. It just depends on if you're talking about glucose versus galactose. Lactose, so I put a few of these on here. Make sure you do understand what the building blocks are, but. Also, this is a beta one to four glycosidic linkage. They can ask the difference between alpha, beta, one, four, one, six. And so please know what the difference is. Lactase is a brush border disaccharide. So it's in that brush border. So as it goes through the intestine, that's where it is. So if you have destruction in that brush border, a big thing is you're gonna have lactose intolerance. And so that is a really big um, clinical correlate that they will test you on. And it go and they'll talk about it too in the digestion portion and the more anatomy portion, but this is a big one. Sucrose, um, again, it says brush border disaccharides, um, the building blocks, but uh, this one wasn't as high yield as the other ones. But again, if it's in red, you should probably know it. Maltose, this is an alpha 1,4 glycosidic link. Make sure you know the difference between these. It's a reducing sugar. This is another brush border disaccharase. Glycogen, okay, you're gonna go over this a lot when you do the glycogen, glycogen storage diseases. Um, so this slide really isn't important because it's really just a basic overview of it. The Ninja Nerds video on glycogen metabolism is fantastic if you haven't watched it, but I wanted to put this on here for completion's sake. Um, so know the difference between alpha 1,4 and alpha 1,6. Um, glycogenin is the core protein. This was that, um, I believe this was the initial protein that you can build off of. But again, this slide is a very brief overview for the really good stuff. You need to look at the glycogen metabolism stuff. Starch, I remember this being a thing on our exam, I believe. So it's just a bunch of glucose units. That's all it is. Starch is just a bunch of glucose units. We're going to look at this in more detail uh, when we talk about glycogen later on. Mm -hmm. Cellulose, um, I also remember this being a thing. So um, I don't remember what it was, though. But it might have just been that it was dietary fiber. But you need to know what that is. Okay, bioenergetics. I did not put very much on this because this is a very conceptual DLA and it goes into so much detail, but we are going to hit on the high points that are very high yield because this is very conceptual. Now, you probably all looked at this from chemistry and undergrad, maybe other courses. The difference between 
exergonic and endergonic, yes, you do need to know exo versus endo, release of energy versus consuming energy. You need to know which one is delta G negative, which one is delta G positive, which one is spontaneous versus which one is not spontaneous. So this is a very high yield slide. There are a lot of other slides in this DLA that say pretty much the same thing. So I put this one on here because I like it because it's a graph. You might have two or three questions on the exam, but I'm gonna go over what, because uh, it's very conceptual, so conceptual, um, but making an unfavorable reaction favorable so you can increase the concentrations of your substrate. So if you overload your system with substrate, it's gonna push it towards the product. So that's what this means. So you can go to the next slide, Brady. So that's what this means. If you just overload it with the substrate, it's going to push it towards the product, even though it might be unfavorable. If you overload it with the substrate, you can push it, you can make the reaction go. Now, the next slide is the big money slide, thermodynamic coupling. This is what I was talking about in the beginning of glycolysis when you have to break down ATP to get it to go. Why are we breaking down ATP? Because the reactions are not favorable. But ADP or ATP to ADP is a highly favorable reaction. It's highly negative. And the coupling of ATP to those reactions or ATP to ADP pushes it in the forward direction towards the product. So you can go to the next slide. So if you have an unfavorable, and then we're going to say this favorable product is ATP. If you couple them together, again, it's going to push that reaction. That's why that you have to invest some energy right off the bat in glycolysis, because those are not favorable reactions. You need to get them to go. So you're using that energy that you get from the breaking of that um, phosphate bond to push this reaction in the forward. Um, forward. So next slide. So this is the only math slide I put on here. The DLA video does a really good job of explaining this. But basically what you need to know, you do need to know how to add up these in to say if it's gonna be favorable. You do need to look at the reaction it's giving you because it could put just a reaction, but when you're asking, when it's asking the question, it's actually asking the flip of it. So if you flip it, all you do is you flip the sign from positive to negative or negative to positive. So when you're going through there, just make sure you're reading the question very carefully. This is not complicated math at all. Um, it's more conceptual, but you will probably have a math question on this. Again, just make sure you're reading as long as you're reading, as long as you understand the pathway, which is also probably why you should know all of the reactions in glycolysis. Um, and when I say that, you just need to know the steps. Um, you don't need, yeah, you just need to know the steps, but it can tell you if something is going in the forward direction or the backwards direction. But I didn't put any more math slides on here because it kind of goes over the same thing over and over and over again. And I'll just say, don't make this more complicated than it needs to be, right? So find the main reaction. That's this one right here, okay? And then there's two sub-reactions that make the total one. So of these two, anything on the reaction side needs to be in the reactants of the main one. If for some reason they're in the products, you need to flip it and flip the sign. So find the main reaction, Everything in the reactant side needs to match everything over here. So if you have to flip it over to make sure everything's on the reaction side, you just flip the sign, okay? Yep. And then I put this on here as well. I kind of like this because it's also conceptual for ATP. Um, just knowing that how you build up and break down ATP can help couple reactions. Um, but I put this on here because I thought it was good conceptually. But for the bioenergetics, the simple math, um, again, just read, and then the idea of um, the coupling, and then please, 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 uh, it's like chemistry 101 from undergrad, the exothermic, endothermic, spontaneous versus not spontaneous. 
it, they will ask about that. And so it's very simple if you look over it, but if you just take for granted, oh, I knew this, you might forget it because there's so much stuff in DM. You might forget those little things. So just please go over that because that is fair game on the exam. Okay, metabolism and fat and fasting. This is a very short um, four slide DLA. I really just put the, um, the words on here for you so that we can go through a couple of these things. Some of this, as you go through all of these metabolism le um, lectures, it gets to be a little intuitive, um, but definitely don't take that for granted. Don't take that for granted. So this is the switch for insulin because we're in the fed state, also called um, postprandial, which is the two hours after you consume food. So you need to know what increases please, please, please know what increases, know what decreases, know the switches. So you're absorbing dietary glucose. So that makes sense because glucose is high. You're getting it into your cells. Tags are absorbed because you have increased glucose. You're making those tags. You're making those stores. Protein is absorbed. Um, increase, you have increased insulin secretion. So you decrease glucagon. This is just that switch. This is the definition of that insulin glucagon switch right here, number four. So you have glycolysis, you have glycogenesis. So making glycogen. So all of this again is that insulin switch. Um, fatty acid synthesis from acetyl-CoA because you're getting a buildup of acetyl-CoA because you have a lot of glycolysis going on. And so some of that is going to go into energy some of that is going to go into um, fatty acids. Brain is getting energy. Red blood cells are getting energy into adipocytes. So all of this is storage. So you're seeing a theme here and the theme is storage. The theme is building up. Um, yeah, so we can go to the next one. So the next one is going to be the glucagon switch. So if you um, have a low blood sugar, this ratio is going to change and this ratio is going to cause the opposite of essentially everything else. So glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, um, you're going to get lactate formation, um, adipose lipolysis is active. So I'll remember the theme, just look at the theme, it's breakdown versus building up. So we don't need to go through the rest, but that's just kind of the general idea. PDH and TCA. I put my whiteboarding on here because I like how it, I have it a little more condensed. You can go to the next slide, Brady. Oh, this is the first slide. Um, so pyruvate is oxidized. That's an important word, oxidized. You do need to need, know these terms, oxidation, decarboxylation. Um, make sure you do know those terms. So we are, yeah, you can get to the next slide. So PDH is three enzymes. It's a three enzyme complex and each of these do different things. So I think my whiteboarding is on the next slide. You can go. Yes. So I watch Ninja Nerds because I love it. So you need to know the cofactors. I'm going to stay here for a second. Uh, annotate. There we go. So you have your pyruvate, which is right here. You get carbon dioxide as a product right here. So it transfers to this thymine pyrophosphate. So this is the big one here, thymine pyrophosphate. You need to know the big um, ones for each of these. Each has one, each of these has one, so you need to know. So it passes it to TTP, then you go here, you have the lipoate here, it passes it here, and it's gonna pass it here. So FAD is the one in the third um, section. And so this is how you're getting your acetyl-CoA right here. This is your acetyl-CoA. So it goes through this um, enzyme complex, three enzymes. So you have pyruvate dehydrogenase, dihydro, I'm not going to try to pronounce that, <laughs> but you need to know three enzymes, 
This one is thymine pyrophosphate. This is one is lipoate. Next one is FAD. You need to need to need to know that. And at the end, you're getting your acetyl-CoA. And you'll notice on the sides, um, because it you have different defects, of course, anything with um, thymine pyrophosphate, you thymine, that's the big one, big thing. Thymine, you can get very, very, but you can go to the next one. Brady. This is the regulation. I had a sticky note drawn out, um, but I threw it away and I don't have a picture of it, but I put this in because I like how this looks like a wheel. And so it's saying that pyruvate dehydrogenase is going to, um, you have PDH kinase, PDH phosphatase, these are your two big ones. Then you have the, uh, you turn it off and you turn it on. So you need to know PDH kinase and then PDH phosphatase. So I really like this picture because it looks like um, a wheel and that's how I drew it out for myself. Okay, I put these side by side because I wanted to show activation and, hit and inhibition together. So activation, you are dephosphorylation of the serine residues. That's very important. Very, very, very important. Serine is going to be one of those buzzwords on there. So dephosphorylation of the serine residues on that first enzyme. The phosphatase is stimulated and you are turning it on versus the PDH kinase um, or the inhibition, you um, phosphorylation, inhibition of PDH upon phosphorylation. Uh, the serine residues, again, notice it's the serine. That's very important. That will probably be a test question. Um, so, and then you can see the kinase has activation and inhibition. So this gets a little crazy with the, um, if you go to the slide before Brady, you'll notice that each one of these, the PDH kinase and the PDH phosphatase has stuff that is going to activate and inhibit it. So please make sure you um, notice this. Please make sure you write this down and understand what is going to inhibit, upregulate and downregulate each one of these enzymes and then the PDH complex. Okay, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, tender loving care for Nancy. Please, 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 please know this. These are all the cofactors involved. We kind of went over this. TPP is for the first enzyme. Lipoic is for the second. FAD is for the third. No, I wouldn't say no. Um, you don't need to know the different enzyme units, I don't believe. It's just the PDH complex, you need to know the cofactors. Um, and then of course, if there's a cofactor, there's probably a disease associated with it. But um, tender loving care for Nancy, there is another one that has tender loving care for Nancy. Does anyone know what the other one is? alpha ketone glutarate dehydrogenase. Mm -hmm. So make sure you know those. And just so you know, that there's a third one as well that y'all are going to come up to. It's the branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase. So there will be three. Yeah, the keto acid one. Right. So there will be three. Those will be the ones you need to know for the exam. Yeah. Um, also, please know B1, B2, B3, B5. They can put either NAD or B3, but please, 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 please know the difference. Please know them, all the names. Yeah, the next slide. Thiamine deficiency. I've mentioned this multiple, multiple times. It comes up on your exam and multiple questions. This is, I mean, this is really important. Thiamine deficiency often um, stems from alcohol use. And so that's a big one, especially with Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome. And so um, make sure that you know the presentation of these. So confabulation is a big word they like to use with um, Wernicke, Korsakoff and alcohol, alcoholism. That's a big one. And then other thiamine requiring enzymes, we just talked about it, tender loving care for Nancy, alpha keto 
alpha keto glutarate dehydrogenase and the branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase. And so um, please know those. Arbuvate dehydrogenase deficiency. So if you um, can't, if you have a PDH deficiency, you are going to have a buildup of pyruvate, which is going to push it into lactic acid and alanine because you can't go through TCA. So yeah, PDH deficiency. Um, again, make sure you are able to diagnose the patient based off of its presentation. I don't remember this being a thing, but I put this in here for completion's sake. Do you remember this being a thing on the exam, Brady? Uh, I do not, actually. Okay. So just know it is a high affinity for the um, SH. And so that's the big thing in the PDH complex. Okay, TCA. I put the, I like this picture. I think this is a really clean, good picture. So I wanted to include this in here. Um, yes, please know the steps. They can ask um, uh, something and you have to know the order. There's a, there's an acronym. Does someone know, does someone have an acronym? I forgot it. Thiamine deficiency is related to alcoholism because, oh, I'm blinking. Brady, help me. How alcoholism is related to thiamine deficiency. Uh, uh, I'll look it up. I think the, ac the acronym was uh, citrate is a uh, starting substrate uh, for uh, making um, uh, oxygen, whatever that is. Yeah, yeah, that's the one I knew. You, I haven't seen this one. A lot of you guys are putting in the chat. I haven't seen that one. <laughs> Funny. Yeah, the one I use, I think it's citrate is Krebs starting substrate for making oxo oxaloacetate. I think that's the one I used. Yeah, that's from yeah. Ninja. Yeah. I mean, I love ninjas, so it makes sense. Lindsay, I thought it was more complicated. Actually, it's just poor nutrition. Uh, you don't, you, okay. you, chronic alcoholics tend to not want to eat food, messes up their buzz. So you see, vitamins. I thought that's what it was, but I didn't want to say it and be wrong. So I was like, I'll just get Brady to look it up. <laughs> but yes, please know the order of these. Please know the enzymes. Um, this is one I did draw out a couple times to make sure I knew it and the reason um, so that you know what goes where. But in the next slide, I think we have the three that are um, regulated. You know what, Lindsay, that just uh, reminded me. Remember, there is that situation where like someone that's a chronic alcoholic and they, they, they have poor nutrition, all of a sudden they eat like a, they, they use the example, they eat a piece of cake, like like a, a ton of sugar. And then it, it burned the little thiamine they have, it burns it really quickly because it pushes it through. Uh, glycolysis and then their Wernicke Korsakoff gets tremendously worse because the little bit of thiamine they had uh, yeah, was got used burned to... out. Yeah, but that was one of the questions that came up. So y'all should keep that in mind. <laughs> we can go to the next slide, Brady. So these are the three that are regulated. Citrate synthes synthase, which is um, that first one. So you have, you have the acetyl-CoA, the synthrate, citrate synthase pushes it towards the citrate to get the cycle going. Then you have isocitrate dehydrogenase, which I which I always had issues with because I felt like other ones should have been regulated just because of the names. I don't know, that was my weird mental games going on when I was trying to study this, but it's isocitrate dehydrogenase. And then alpha keto glutarate dehydrogenase, that's the big one. This one also has tender loving care for Nancy. Um, please know how these are regulated. Please know how these are regulated. So if you look at citrate, citrate synthase, it's inhibited by its product. So that makes sense because citrate is that first one in the TCA. 
reactions. And so if you have enough citrate, it's going to say, hey, stop it. We're good. We don't need any more. So it's going to stop it. And then it's, you know, up the line, it's going to push it towards um, other reactions. So this one makes sense that it's product availability for the reaction. Um, for isocitrate dehydrogenase, this one makes NADH. So it makes sense then that it's going to be inhibited by NADH and also ATP because NADH is going to transfer its electrons, which um, increases ATP. So if you have enough, it's going to say, hey, stop, we have enough, you don't need to go anymore. And then of course, the opposite of that ADP um, means you're low in ATP. So it's like, hey, come on, let's rev up, let's go. The calcium thing is because if we are exercising, we're releasing that calcium. And so calcium can also come in, it can allosterically act Activate and say, hey, we need some more ATP. Let's get going. So that can also do it as well. Alpha ketoglutarate, again, kind of the same thing, um, inhibited by NADH and sectional CoA. So it's basically product availability. And then in calcium again, because uh, if you have increased demands, that's how the body tells itself, this is what we're doing, this is what we need. Increased demands, you are going to um, affect what you need. I love all of the, uh... okay, this is what it produces. Um, yes, you need to know it. Just please understand it. Understand how many you get. This is rote memorization, honestly, what you get from what. Malfunction. So these are different ways that you can um, inhibit it. So fluoral acetate inhibits aconitase, melanate inhibits succinate dehydrogenase. So I mean, these are just knowing them, honestly. Okay, ETC and oxidative phosphorylation. So I really like this picture on the right because it shows you the um, NADH products FADH2 products coming off of here, excuse me, and going into the ETC. So I really like this picture. I was trying to find something, but it was like, ah, the one in your slide is actually really good. I like it. But all of this um, carbohydrates, fatty acids, amino acids are all oxidized to carbon dioxide and water. This is through the ETC. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So again, this is my whiteboarding. I put this on here because this makes a lot of sense to me. So you need to know, you don't need to know like the itty bitty details of these, um, go over them, but know the big picture. The most important thing is you're knowing the big picture. So you have the, I'll annotate it since I'm talking on it. You have the TCA right here. You have the NADHs. It's coming over here. It's donating its electrons. So you need to know this is where you're getting um, electron transfer. You're getting electron transfer here. You're getting electron transfer here. That is really important. You do need to know which of these complexes are actually allowing proton um, transfer um, into this space. So electrons are transferred here. And then it goes here, NADH comes in at one, FADH2 comes in at complex two. Yes, please know that. You need to know the difference of where NADH comes into the system and FADH2 comes into the system. And so your electrons just keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And then down here, Oxygen right here is your final electron acceptor. This is why this is an aerobic process. And if you are in a cell that has high oxygen demands and it depletes it, or if you're in a cell that does not have mitochondria, that's why you're going to be anaerobic because you don't have that um, final electron acceptor there. You can go to the next slide, Brady. Um, so this is a really good one too. Um, notice that, oh, I'm not, I don't know, annotate. What is this? That's complex two, uh, which is part of the TCA as well. Yep. Uh, it's called succinyl-CoA 
dehydrogenase, I think. I forgot yep. the full name, but I know it's succinyl something. Yeah. So make sure you understand that this is that um, this enzyme is actually part of the ETC that is embedded in here. And no, it is not a trans membrane. Doesn't go all the way across, but um, you'll see here four electrons are going here, four and then two. You do need to know that. That is important. I didn't put all the little details of each of these on here. Um, read through them, please understand them. But the biggest things are where you're getting NADH, where you're getting FADH2 into the system. Um, FAD, you need to know any cofactors associated with them, how many protons are transferred across, all that stuff. And then this is just more detailed. I put this in for completion's sake because it shows FADH2 versus NADH. You don't, uh, like, like it says on the thing, you don't need to memorize this, but I wanted to put this here for completion's sake. What I would look at here is this FMN is in this process right here for complex one. This makes me want to throw up. What the hell is going on? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yeah, please do not memorize this. Okay, ATP synthase. Um, the biggest thing you do need to know F1 versus F0 or F0, whatever you want to call it, you do need to know which is which. That is very important. But that's pretty much the big thing with ATP synthase. Um, you know that it is the generator of ATP using that proton gradient, which is going to piggyback up what we're going to talk about next with all of the issues that can come with the ETC. The only reason I put this on here was to show the difference between NADH and FADH2. Um, it's how many ATP you get. This slide is says a lot to kind of, it's kind of like the derivation things you see in calculus or physics where they go through all of this stuff to get to their point. And the point is this, and ADH yields about three, FADH2 yields about two. The shuttles, we can talk about this. Um, you have two shuttles. And this is because NADH can't cross the inner mitochondrial membrane. Why do we care? Because we got some NADH in glycolysis, right? What, um, what enzyme in glycolysis are you getting NADH from? Think about the name of the enzyme. Is it glycerol free phosphate dehydrogenase? Dehydrogenase, anything with a dehydrogenase is dealing with NADH. So you get some NADH in glycolysis and like, okay, this can be used to do ATP, but it can't get across. So how do we get it across? This is how we get it across. So there is a shuttle to deliver these electrons. Um, so glycer, glycerophosphate shuttle, malate dehydrogenase, sh de 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 malate dehydrogenase, shuttle. Ninja Nerds does a really good job at explaining both of these, the exact process that is going on here. So um, I would encourage you to watch that. And then of course, um, the difference in the synthesis, synthesis of two versus synthesis of three. Um, I put this on here for completion sake again, when will it be active? This makes sense because if you need ATP, you're going to be active. And if you have a lot of NADH is gonna be active um, because it wants to um, give its protons, give its electrons to the gradient. Okay. I'm pretty sure first aid has a really good way to memorize all of these. So um, complex one is the rote known. So rote known, I'm gonna annotate. Rote known has the one in it. Um, complex three actinomycin, um, I think so. I forgot why there was a three in there, but that's how I remembered it. It's in first aid, I think, but it's in a mycin three. And then the ides, so id, 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 id are all complex four. 
complex four. And then oligomycin, you just have to know this is complex five ATP synthase. But first aid, I think, has a really good way of remembering it. But you do need to know all of those. Please memorize those. You can go to the next one. Now, the uncoupler or the oh inhibitors. Now, please know the difference between something that affects the ETC versus ATP synthase. If you affect the ETC complexes, you're going to reduce electron transport and you're not going to establish that proton gradient. Versus inhibitors of ATP synthase, it's initially not affected. You're still getting the gradient. You still have this gradient, but um, it's, I forgot my train of thought there, but but the big thing is one is going to affect the actual setting up of the gradient. One is not. So please know the difference between those two. If you have an inhibitor of ATP synthase, again, electron transport isn't affected initially because you are going to get a gradient set up. But once the gradient has been set up, you don't get that flow. So look, protons will leak back. Um, and if you have something that inhibits this, this is the uncoupling. What does uncoupling mean? It's not affected by the ATP synthase is now uncoupled to the gradient because the gradient now is these protons are leaking back. Again, Ninja Nerds explained this really well. When you get it leaking back, it's uncoupled because usually when the gradient is set, set up, ATP synthase uses as that gradient to make ATP. But if we um, if we uncouple it by the leakage, then it's going, you're going to get um, the pathology there. And you're, you're basically just going to produce heat, right? So you're just running this cycle without making ATP. So that's the idea of the thermogenic. Mm -hmm. It can also be dangerous too. All right, so then uh, I think there was a case when like if you're cold, then your uncouplers will will do that. Like it will produce heat as well. So like which they're found in brown fat, like in babies. But like in that case, do we also does that like are we inhibiting uh the the ETC also? Because I know saying, like go ahead. I'm I'm not sure that so like adults don't don't have brown fat to my knowledge. It's mm -hmm. like it's it's for infants to to make uh, to make heat basically without making ATP. It just cycles through and makes heat. But also in bears when they hibernate, that's the idea. But I don't think in um, in adults they actually use it. No, um, no, I, I know, but uh, I mean the way the reason I mentioned brown fat is because it's used like in infants, as you said, uh, to like to heat, but like. Um, are we also inhibiting ETC in that case, or is that a different pathway? I, no, I you're, un, you're yeah, uncoupling yeah. the ATP synthase from the ETC. That's what that means. You're, it's not that you're inhibiting the ETC, you're affecting the ATP synthase, you're affecting the gradient, and you're uncoupling the ATP synthase from that gradient. But you're not inhibiting, you're not affecting the actual ETC. Right, but also uh, an uncoupling, like uh, when, in the case where we have uh, like the uncoupling protein, uh, protein get involved, you don't have production of ATP. And that's why the reason I said inhibitor, even though it's not inhibiting, but then when you reach the ma that maximum, uh, that maximum like gradient where, where you can't pump any more um, uh, protons and then ATP stops on work, yeah, the ATP simply stop on working. Uh, then you start producing heat, no? Okay, so there's two there's two separate processes, right? So you can actually have like oligomycin that will actually inhibit it, inhibit the ATP synthase. So in that case, the gradient gets too strong because you're not you're the the turnstile or the the ATP synthase that's making ATP isn't working. So then it'll the gradient will just get be too much and it'll start leaking. That's the inhibition process. But what Lindsay's saying is the uncoupling process doesn't involve necessarily involve the inhibition. 
the thermogenin will actually help to uncouple it. You could put pores through the membrane or it can leak through the membrane. So like brown fat, for example, just uses the uncoupling process. It's not, it's not a direct inhibition. Yeah, so it'll slow it down because remember, so it's not inhibiting the ETC, but it'll slow it down because um, it senses that it can't go essentially, but it's not going to inhibit the ETC. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Thanks. So think of it like the idea of ATP is like this storage form, right? Uh, of you're, you're, you're making ATP and you're, you're constantly storing the energy. The idea is if you're not doing that, storing the energy, how, where does the energy go? You have to directly burn it as heat, all right? So, opposed, so if we do the process correctly, we're not making heat, we're actually storing it as ATP. But if not, you uncouple it, then that ATP that would be produced has to go, that, that energy has to go somewhere. So that's how it makes heat. Okay, and does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, this, this is really just a definition for you guys, something to understand the adenine nucleotide translocase. So the unidirectional exchange of ATP for ADP, this is how you're getting it out of the mitochondria. Um, so it's a symport with um, phosphate and hydrogen ions. And it can be affected. So I think that's the next slide. That's the bong, yeah, the atractalicide and the bong um, creek acid. Please know both of these. Um, these are fair game. Okay, so this is then uncoupling that we just talked about. Um, so uncouplers when uncoupling occurs when hydrogen ions are gonna re-enter the matrix without going through the ATP synthase. That's what it means by uncoupling. So hydrogen ions are supposed to go through the ATP synthase. It's supposed to be this cohesive thing, a, um, ETC and then ATP synthase. But if they're re-entering without going through ATP synthase, you're essentially separating the process that should be going together to form that ATP. So you're dissipating. So like, like we said, you're, re you're reducing ATP synthesis because you're not using the ATP synthase, which is the ATP generator. Um, so all of, so this actually kind of goes to what you were talking about, the uncoupling and the ETC. So the ETC is actually going to increase because we're not inhibiting it. The ETC isn't being inhibited. The thing that's being inhibited is the um, gradient and then uh, the ATP synthase using that gradient, increasing oxygen consumption and then release of energy as heat. This is the big, 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 big thing you're releasing it as heat. So star that, highlight it. Um, these are the examples. Um, DNP and ASA, aspirin, um, these are high yield ones. Thermogen is high yield uh, because of the brown fat. Um, and then I put what it had on the thermogen here. So brown adipose tissue, generation of heat. So this is a physiological process. This is, it calls it the biological heating pad. And so this is a normal process that happens in infants, but again, adults don't have that brown heat. And so um, it can actually be a bad thing if you have these other uncouplers. So the DNP and the aspirin, the gramidicin, the valinomycin, if you, if you uncouple this too much, an effect is you can have the malignant hyperthermia. So it's not always a good thing. Um, I didn't put all of these on here, but, I, but you should look at these. Um, know where the defect is. So it specifies um, the, uh, Lieber's hereditary optic neuropathy is a defect in complex one. So um, do you go through here, but I don't remember this being super, super high yield. Gluconeogenesis. So this is 
not the opposite of glycolysis. So don't think, please don't think of it as the direct opposite of glycolysis because um, you have those not um, irreversible reactions and you can't just flip the switch and it goes back up the way it came. So since we can't flip a switch and it just goes back up, there are a few enzymes that we have to go through to get back to glucose. Yeah, the next slide. Purpose of gluconeogenesis, we're getting blood sugar. So um, when your blood sugar drops, if you're fasting, of course, you want to get that blood sugar because that is your energy source. So you can get it from multiple, yeah, synthesis of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources, mainly amino acids, lactate, glycerol, which we'll go through in the um, succeeding slides. So again, it's not reversible. There are some reversible reactions that can go in the other direction, but um, the ones that are not reversible, these are highly tested, high, very high yield. So pyruvate can't just go back to Pepsi, um, phosphoenol pyruvate. You have to kind of bypass it. So in the mitochondria, we have pyruvate carboxylase. You go to oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate can go back into the cytosol. Then you have Pepsi-K. And now you're back at um, phosphoenol pyruvate. This is um, reversible, so you can just go back up. And again, phosphofructose kinase 1. Remember when we were talking about that bifunctional enzyme, how there's a switch of um, PFK2 versus the F26 by phosphatase? This is where that comes into play. And so that's the regulation. So if you're switching the regulation, you're turning off PFK1, and you have another enzyme that's upregulated, which is fructose 1,6 bisphosphatase. So that bifunctional enzyme would be on the glucose side, but it'll switch off when you don't need the glycolytic pathway. So you're getting the decrease in F2,6 bisphosphate. So you're not um, activating this, and instead you're going to uprate fruit up regulate fructose 1,6 bisphosphatate. And then this is super important, glucose 6-phosphatase is in the ER. So you actually have to go into the endoplasmic reticulum. That is where this enzyme is. Extremely high yield, guys. Glucose 6-phosphatase is in the ER. And this is the enzyme that is going to allow you to go from G6P back to glucose. And then glucose can be transported out through your um, membrane transporter. So these are the highly, um, these are very high yield. This is what you think about when you think of gluconeogenesis. Okay, uses carbons from glucogenic. That's important, glucogenic versus ketogenic amino acids. There's something in first aid that um, has a, handy little mnemonic, but you need to know glucogenic versus ketogenic amino acids, but we're not using it from acetyl-CoA. Remember, acetyl-CoA can't go back. Acetyl-CoA has to go to um, oxaloacetate, and then oxaloacetate goes back to um, phosphoenol pyruvate. So pyruvate cannot be used in this, so we can't just flip a switch and it goes back up. Um, so please remember that acetyl-CoA, you cannot use it. Um, but acetyl-CoA, you're going to learn when you do beta, um, beta oxidation, um, you can do fatty acid degradation. So there are other ways acetyl-CoA can be broken down. Gluconeogenesis is not one of them. So you are going to learn a lot about that in later lectures, but it'll make sense when you put it all out. Okay, the glucose alanine cycle. So um, you are using alanine from proteolysis, breaking down of the proteins. That is a big contributor to this gluconeogenesis pathway. So you're, um, you have protein degradation, you're getting it in there, and that's the gluconeogenesis. Lactate. Again, this is a reversible, lactic dehydrogenase is re a reversible reaction. So you can go to lactate, you can go to um, pyruvate. Again, pyruvate um, will, can go back up the other way. It's not necessarily back up, but pyruvate uh, can be used. Okay, <coughs> I'm getting a little hoarse now.
Okay, pyruvate is mainly formed from lactate and alanine. Remember, the only irreversible reaction from pyruvate is the one going to acetyl-CoA. The others are reversible. So that means that they can converge at the pyruvate level. But um, go back, sorry. Notice here, acetyl-CoA formed during the beta oxidation inhibits PDH. This is a really important concept because it, this is the regulation of switching on and off different pathways that you need and don't need at a certain time. So you get the beta oxidation that's breaking down into acetyl-CoA, which in, so an excess of acetyl-CoA um, product inhibition um, inhibits it and it drives it towards gluconeogenesis. So it's gonna activate pyruvate carboxylase. So these are happening at the same time. These two things are happening at the same time. So you get that drive towards gluconeogenesis. Um, let's um, yeah. Sorry, I have a quick question. On that slide, um, when we're talking about gluconeogenesis, I'm assuming we're in a high energy state because we have a lot of acetyl-CoA. So my question is, would we take that glucose and then um, make glycogen stores out of it? Like, why are we making glucose in a high energy state? Or is it to do with uh, low blood glucose? So it is going to raise your glucose levels. Um, so we are going to, yes, this can be used for energy. These can be used for energy. Does that make sense? Because you can break it down, it goes into the bloodstream and your other tissues can use it for energy. Like my only confusion is then if we're using it for energy, why aren't we just continuing with the PDH and the TCA? I um, acetyl-CoA means we already have a lot of energy. So then why make, is it just because we want to up our blood glucose or? Brady, you want to chime in too? I don't think it's a direct correlate. Like, I think it also has to do with like the buildup of NADH as well. And like, it gets more complicated than that. So I think it's, it's trying to balance everything out. Like the idea of having, like going through the cycle to increase energy production and balancing the glucose levels. So I think it's it's like one of these weird branch points where like, but I, I do think uh, NADH comes into play as well, which is one of the complications. Does that make sense? All of these are happening and they're highly, highly regulated. All of these are highly regulated based on the needs of the cell. And so, and this does get more complicated than even we're going to go into as well, because there are side products like citrate and alanine and like I said, NADH that come into play. And it's like little uh, side pockets that you need to correct, because if you get too much deviation with these, um, then, then it's going to mess up the whole cycle. So you'll see this. And when we get into ketones and stuff like that, all these little regulatory side products that build up are going to have to come into play as well. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you so much. So I put this on here to show the direction. So we have pyruvate and then we need carbon dioxide for this. That is an important substrate. So carbon dioxide, pyruvate, remember beta oxidation is happening at the same time. So buildup of acetyl way pushes it towards this way, pushes it towards oxaloacetate versus citrate. So we get the pyruvate carboxykinase carboxylase, oxaloacetate, and then it has to go to malate because we have the malate shuttle here. Oxaloacetate can't just go out, but malate can go to back to oxaloacetate. And then you have Pepsi-K, which brings it to phosphoenolpyruvate. But remember, we have all of these other things that can get to pyruvate, but it can't go back up to PEP. So you can go through here, pyruvate, can go to oxaloacetate, it comes back here. So you have a lot of things that contribute to the cycle, but remember pyruvate can't go back up, so it has to go through this cycle. But once you get um, Pepsi-K to PEP, then you can go back through the reversible reactions, and then you have the other two enzymes that you can um, upregulate to do gluconeogenesis. So I put this on here. Um, so 
remember the carbon uh, the carbon dioxide is added this will form oxaloacetate but we really just went over that okay the glucogenic amino acids are alanine and glutamine yes please know those because they can ask you the difference between the ketogenic versus the um, glucogenic amino acids um, so you get proteolysis, so you're getting these uh, amino acids in. It can go to the pyruvate, which then goes to oxaloacetate, and oxaloacetate can be acted upon, um, and you're getting PEP-CK to PEP, and then you can go up. But also notice amino acids can come in at different levels of this system. And so even though we're not going through the TCA, our main goal is not to get NADH, amino acids can come into many parts of the system. And then if we're switching out, if we're do, flipping the switch to gluconeogenesis, you're still getting all of this and you can get to oxaloacetate and then you can go through the gluconeogenesis pathway. Okay, which cells release free fatty acids and glycerol to use at low blood glucose? So these are um, ways you can get into the gluconeogenesis pathway as well. So you can release the free fatty acids, you can release the glycerol. Remember TAG is from the adipocytes. Um, you will learn about, actually they briefly mention it, but you get the, um, the lipoprotein lipase, which is going to break down, but you the products of the tag are going to be the free fatty acids and the glycerol, but um, fatty acids are taken up and that's for beta oxidation and the glycerol is for gluconeogenesis. So the base, so what I would take away from the slide is the breakdown of the tag, you get two products, the um, one product goes into one place, one product goes into another place. So that is the big takeaway from this slide. Okay, and glucose 6-phosphate, um, remember I said that you, this is not done in the cytosol, you have to go to the ER. So you go up here, you're able to upregulate f 16 bisphosphatase so you can get to G6P, but this doesn't go just to glucose, you are going to the smooth ER, you have two transporters, T1 and T2. I don't think SGU talked about this, Ninja Nerd talked about this and it made sense. Um, so I put this on here. But um, this enzyme is located in the ER, you get glucose, glucose is transported out back to the cytosol. And then of course your transporters that can go back and that's how it's going to get into your system. Beta oxidation, remember this goes at the same time. So fatty acid degradation um, is going to provide the ATP during low glucose level. So this is kind of the answer to what you were talking about earlier is why are we doing this? Don't we need ATP? So we have that um, ATP generation from the fatty acid degradation. When you, when you look at that, you get a whole ton of ATP from fatty acid oxidation. Compared to glycolysis, it's, glycolysis is like nothing. You barely get any ATP um, compared to um, beta oxidation. You get an insane amount from beta oxidation. But um, so you have the fatty acid degradation, you're getting that ATP for functions at a low glucose level. And then gluconeogenesis, you are getting the increase in um, blood glucose, but beta oxidation provides the regulators for that switch. So you get that acetyl-CoA and that is going to allow for you to have the switch. So um, this is what this is. So this is our gluconeogenesis, but beta oxidation, you get a lot of acetyl-CoA. You get a lot, a lot, a lot of acetyl-CoA from um, the beta oxidation. And so you are going to activate PDH kinase, which is going to inhibit the PDH complex. So it's switching. So I've said this a couple times, this is why it runs at the same time because you want that inhibitor of the TCA. So you're pushing it towards gluconeogenesis. <laughs> All right. Well, 
Okay, so let's take a five minute break. All right, I'm ready if you guys are. I'll try to keep it at about an hour, maybe a little bit more, but um, if I go too fast, then y'all can stop me. We good? Y'all ready? Yes, no, maybe so. Yes. No, never ready. All right, well, let's do this. All right, so let's do the embryo. Now, uh, obviously with embryo as it's been so far, keep it clinical, right? They're gonna ask you some sort of clinical problem and uh, it's gonna correlate with the embryological derivatives. So I'm gonna cover the stuff that we, that was high yield that um, was highly tested, right? So conveniently in the gut, in the GI tract, everything's broken down into foregut, midgut, hindgut. It works out good because uh, the, the nervous structure, the blood supply is all broken down into these three segments. So there's a nice table coming up. You keep that in your mind. Um, it should be pretty straightforward. And the questions on the exam were pretty straightforward as well. So <clears throat> the foregut's gonna go straight into uh, the major duodenal papilla. That's the second part right here of the duodenum. And then the midgut is going to go two thirds to the transverse colon. One third of the transverse colon to the rectum and anus will be uh, the hindgut. So keep that in mind, then everything will work out. Now, like I said, the celiac artery is gonna to go to the foregut, superior, superior mesenteric midgut, inferior to the hindgut. So um, just make sure you kind of know where everything breaks down, but um, it's pretty self-explanatory. Okay, just a couple of defi definitions. Stenosis is gonna be a complete closure. So recannulization is basically, if you have a tube and it's closing, and it's recannulized, it opens the tube back up. So it's a tube that uh, you want to have a hollow tube. So stenosis is going to be, uh, 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 sorry, I might've said that wrong. Stenosis is a partial failure of recannulization. So at some point it didn't completely open up. Atresia is going to be a complete uh, failure to recannulize. So you can't get through it all. So stenosis is like a narrowing. Atresia is going to be a complete closure. Don't get tripped up with this. All you really need to know is that where things go. Okay, so it starts out very much anterior, posterior, ventral and dorsal mesogastrum. But if you just remember that the stuff on the anterior side goes to the right. So stuff you would expect to be on your right, such as your liver is gonna go, it's gonna start out anterior, it's gonna go to the right. Same thing. So the stuff that's posterior is gonna go to the left. So the stomach and everything. So they can ask you either it started posterior and where did it end up? Or they'll ask you uh, what structure was posterior that ended up on say the left, right? So as long as you remember the stuff that was anterior goes to the right, stuff that was posterior goes to the left. You should be able to answer the questions. So some clinical stuff, uh, pyloric stenosis. I believe this is, yeah, it's more common in males um, so some, some of the red stuff here, or the red stuff uh, is important. You get this hypertrophy of the pyloric region, and you could see that here. So this happens right at birth. You would expect it once the baby starts feeding, um, you get projectile vomiting. And now you wouldn't expect it to be bile stained, right? Because the bile comes into play at that second part of the duodenum. So any sort of vomiting that happens uh, prior to that point, especially this, uh, is going to be non-bile staining. So that's a good clinical um, component here. Uh, yeah. So you can see that here. So this is a barium swallow. Uh, this is the stomach here. And you can see this pyloric region or the pyloric region here and the pyloric sphincter. So hypertrophy of this region. So it is a stenosis, uh, at least, uh, actually, I don't know that if, if um, I believe in, I don't know the breakdown, but I think uh, primarily it's a stenosis. At least in this case, you could say it's a stenosis because this swallow got through to the part of the duodenum, this barium swallow. So it's a stenotic valve, it's hypertrophy, uh, and you could see this. So once the baby starts feeding, 
uh, you get uh, a lot of extra fluid that won't pass through. So the only way to go is up. Some of the olive shaped mass in the pyloric region, uh, gastric peristaltic wave, you would expect that because you can't get through. So you get this, this wave formation because of all the fluid that builds up. Again, it's non bilious. Okay, now, like I said before, any, vom uh, any vomiting that happens to uh, food or whatnot prior to this point, this, uh, this uh, second part of the duodenum is gonna be non-bile stained. Anything that comes from lower than that will be bile stained. So they will ask you a question about that. Remember that, that kind of that, brand, that breakdown um, of that second part of the duodenum is, is where this, uh, this hepatopancreatic duct enters, that papilla or the uh, ampulla vader. It's, it's all right about there, that second part. And that's gonna divide the foregut from the midgut. So we talked about this already. Atresia is gonna be a complete closure. Stenosis is gonna be narrowing. So you would see that here. Uh, so if you have, if, you, if they said that the, uh, the, vomit, the vomitus was bile stained, you would expect it to have been from lower than the second part, okay? Uh, and then why would you expect the, uh, the, the child to have polyhydramnios uh, in the womb? Well, that's because you can't properly swallow the fluid. So if you can't get this fluid into the baby and able to, to pee it out, then it's gonna build up in the amniotic sac. One of the classic th things they'll talk about here is this double bubble sign. So the uh, atresia or the, yeah, the atresia is right here at the part of the duodenum. So you have this air, air filling up here and then you have the pyloric sphincter here. So some of the air gets through. So you get this double bubble sign. But the reason all this air is building up is because uh, there's a, an atresia here you can't get through. So the baby can't pass gas, right? So um, that's this double bubble sign. You see that here as well. Okay, the thing you wanna remember, the pancreas, uh, the head of the pancreas actually comes from the ventral part. So when it wraps around and connects to the, the body and the tail part, what happens sometimes is it'll kind of straddle uh, the, the region here of the duct, or I'm sorry, of the, um, the, the, um, the duodenum. And uh, when it does that, it makes a stricture around it. So it can actually cut off the blood supply. This is right around the second part of the duodenum. So just keep that in mind. Some of the, uh, some of the, the terminology, when I remember bif bifid pancreatic, uh, bifid ventral pancreatic bud, okay? So when it, when it kind of encircles the duodenum around that second part, it can cut off blood supply. These weren't super highly tested, but I wanted to keep them in here for completeness sake. So there, there's, there you can have a non-rotation here. You can have a reverse rotation. Uh, and what's important about that clinically is you can have a compression of the transverse colon. You can also have the cecum attached here. So what you wanna remember about this is that it's really difficult to diagnose appendicitis. It looks like some sort of you know upper uh, right upper quadrant pain but that could be because of this um, connection here, this aberrant connection. And then you can also get a volvulus, which is basically just a twisting. So if you twist stuff, obviously if you twist the tube, the, the vasculature, everything around there, um, it, it won't flow. Uh, so you can get a mixed rotation here with the volvulus. So this can cause duodenal obstruction. So maybe just a generalized definition for each of these, you should be fine, but I really wouldn't dive into a lot of details regarding these. Umbilical hernia, um, it could happen. Uh, it's not uh, a big problem. They can, they can fix this. Uh, but if, if you have some sort of, um, of um, lax in the umbilical, uh, the musculature, the umbilical hernia can, can pop through. What's more important is this umphalus seal, which you could see. Remember, seal kind of means like it's sealed off. So you could see this, uh, it has a covering. So the baby will present with the, uh, the, the, the intestines outside of the body, and, but it's covered, right? Because that's a seal. The opposite here is, um, oh, you could see that, yeah. So it has fetal membranes. The opposite here, which is worse, obviously, is gastroschisis. This is similar but you don't have that membrane covering. So one of the, the things you wanna remember is what had happened is the lateral folds didn't completely close, right? So the baby's abdomen didn't close off. So the, uh, the guts and the intestines are completely out. So they're prone to hyperthermia, which makes sense, right? Because you want the, the, the warmth of it um, inside the body to keep the, the intestines warm.
Okay, Meckel's diverticulum, highly tested. They like this mnemonic, we'll get to it in a second. But basically you have this connection here, this aberrant connection that, um, that forms. So uh, one of the clinical things or the, the buzzwords you wanna remember is the umphaloenteric duct. Okay, so you get this retention of it. So uh, one of the things that happens is it can mimic signs of appendicitis just because of proximity to it. So this is the mnemonic, the rule of twos, twice as likely in males, it tends to be two inches long, two feet from the ileocecal valve. That is if you stretch out the intestines, if you were to measure it. Um, and that's why it can often mimic uh, well, it is close. Like I said, you have to stretch it out. But when it's uh, when your intestine all uh, in your abdomen, it is fairly close to the ileocecal valve, which is close to the appendix, which could cause problems. Two percent of the population typically presents in two years of life. Two types of epithelium, right? So this is ectopic tissue, and you want to remember that. So uh, they could do like they could do some sort of like a PET scan and they could uh, identify this ectopic tissue. Um, but just remember that the tissue typically is gastric and pancreatic. Oh, here you go. Yeah, so you could do this, this scan uh, to, to pick up this gastric mucosa. But just remember, typically typical symptomatic presentation will be similar to appendicitis. Okay, just a couple little things. Again, not super highly tested, but a cyst is gonna be closed off, right? It's gonna make a cystic cavity. Fistula is gonna be an opening, right? So you have some sort of tube. So uh, sometimes you can get fecal material that comes out of the fistula, right? Very similar to Meckel's diverticulum, right? But it's, uh, it's an opening. Now the anal canal, what we're gonna talk about primarily is this pectinate in the line. That's what you're gonna ask. Whenever they talk about the anal canal, we want to, you wanna ask yourself, uh, is it above or is it below the pectinate line? Because like the abdomen that is spread out in uh, foregut, midgut, hindgut, uh, a lot of the derivation of the nerves and the vasculature is gonna be derived from the pectinate line. Okay, and you can kind of read about that here. Uh, these weren't highly tested as well. I'll point out the one that they did ask about, um, but just a general uh, uh, definition here should do. So obviously a stenosis or a narrowing here that could cause complications or a backlog of, or a backup of fe uh, feces. Um, you can also get a uh, membranous atresia, so a little membrane around it, persistent membrane. So probably surgically you have to go and just uh, cut that open. Um, and, and also, yeah, it says here, failure of this epithelial plug to pref perforate. Um, you, should, you can also get an imperforate anus right here. Uh, this is not what they asked. Yeah, I think this, mm, I'm not positive. I think they may have asked us one about the fistula, the fistula formation. So, right, so you would expect the anal pit to be here, but instead it made a little fistula right there. So, oh, this is what they asked about. Yeah, so this an anorectal agenesis with a fistula formation. So you can see here that uh, in a female um, that the, the rectum has this fistula. So there is no anus, but the, the fistula goes into the vaginal cavity here. So it's like a rectovaginal fistula. That's what they had asked about. And then you could also get a complete atresia, right? A complete closure of the cavity. So that would have to be repaired surgically as well. Hirschsprung's disease is definitely testable. What you need to know is that it's a failure of migration of the neural crest cells. Guarantee there'll be a question about it. So you have an aganglionic segment. So remember these neural crest cells are, um, they're autonomics, they're, they're nervous tissue, they're, uh, they're nerve fibers. So if you get an aganglionic segment, that means it's not peristalsis. And that's because those neural crest cells didn't go down there. So this is classically called uh, megacolon, congenital megacolon. And you could see, you would expect the peristaltic wave to continue down here, but it doesn't. It's like, it's not dead tissue, but it just doesn't have that, that nervous, uh, that nerve um, peristaltic wave that's forming. So you get this backup here. Okay, let's talk about the autonomics. Remember that the sympathetics are gonna primarily in the gut are gonna come from this pre-aortic uh, prevertebral ganglia. You can see these here. So remember the sympathetics are gonna come from thoracolumbar. Uh, foregut, this is broken down perfectly. Foregut's greater splank mix, midgut is lesser and least splank mix, and hindgut is gonna come from the lumbar splank mix. So this is broken down for you. If they give you uh, 
Oregon, any place in these, you can just easily identify it by knowing where it lies. Okay, and par uh, post ganglia, um, excuse me, parasympathetic, remember they are craniosacral. So primarily in the gut, uh, foregut, midgut, everything's gonna be come from the vagus nerve. Anything for the hindgut is gonna come from the pelvic splenix. Okay, and it makes sense. So parasympathetics, remember, I rest and digest. So increased motility, increased GI secretions. Sympathetic, you're running from a bear. Um, so you don't wanna be worrying about digesting food. Okay, and then this is broken down a little bit more for you. Greater splanchnics, foregut, midgut, lesser and least, hindgut is lumbar. Now, this visceral pain line is similar, right? and they kind of mentioned it in repro. So it's, uh, you know, when we talked about it in repro, it had to do is kind of right around the cervix. So what we talk about here in the gut is that this sympathetic fibers uh, are gonna be above this pelvic pain line, which is gonna be the midpoint of the sigmoid colon. Anything below that will travel with the uh, parasympathetics. Remember sacral splanchnics are sympathetic, pelvic splanchnics are parasympathetic, S and S and P and P. Okay, and then this kind of outlines that as well. Um, so, right, so, but let's talk about it in a little more detail. So when we talk about referred pain, it, I like to use the umbilicus as kind of my guideline. So anything above the umbilicus or epigastric or uh, upper quadrant pain is going to be foregut. Anything mid-gut is going to be periumbilical. Anything below the umbilicus is going to be um, kind of lower uh, or um, uh, uh, lower quadrant or flank pain or groin pain. And then anything below the, this pelvic pain line or the midpoint of the sigmoid colon will go with these per, uh, perennial uh, pelvic splanchnics, okay? So just keep that in mind and um, you should be able to answer any questions if they talk about some sort of visceral pain. Remember, visceral pain is very dull. Uh, somatic pain is gonna be sharp. So this visceral pain that they're feeling is gonna be this dull, achy pain right about around their umbilicus. So you're thinking a mid-gut structure, right? So um, when we talk about uh, appendicitis, which we'll get to in a second uh, here actually. So remember the, the acute onset of appendicitis is typically visceral pain. You start to feel it, it's mid-gut, right? So you're feeling it right around the umbilicus. Once it gets worse, it starts to get so inflamed that it actually touches the parietal peritoneum. Then remember the parietal peritoneum is, um, is somatically innervated. So once it starts doing that, you can actually pinpoint it. The way they use it clinically is they say, can you point to the pain with one finger? If you could do that, typically it's somatic pain. If it's like a dull diffuse pain, it's visceral. So remember, it's gonna start out periumbilical and then um, it, once it gets bad enough, it can, get, it can become somatic. And now, uh, so here, remember that the gallbladder, <clears throat> Uh, any sort of pain here is uh, epigastric, right? So you would expect foregut, it would be above the umbilicus and you can get referred pain right here. Typically they talk about it in this T5 through T7 range. That's the pain you'd feel here, but that's typically caused by a gallbladder. So one of the questions you can ask is what if the patient experiences shoulder pain, left shoulder pain, for example? Remember that uh, the diaphragm runs around here too, and that the, the diaphragm has uh, referred pain to the left shoulder. So that C3 through C5 uh, can cause pain too. But when we're talking about the gallbladder, we usually talk about this uh, T7 through T9 pain. Okay, oh, and this is super imp uh, sympathetics. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, sympathetics. So, well, yeah, yeah. Well, it depends. So when you, we talk about them in the gut here, uh, they're gonna be uh, here. You see them here. So for the foregut, this is a really important slide. So for the foregut, they're gonna be uh, greater thoracic splanchnics for the mid, I might've said that wrong. I might've said sacral splanchnics. That's, in, that's, in, that's referring to uh, the pelvic area. So yeah, Elvis, you're right. Um, so the, the, uh, the sympathetics here, greater thoracic splanchnics, the mid gut's gonna be lesser and least, and lumbar is gonna be the hind gut. Parasympathetic, remember foregut and mid gut are gonna be vagus, and the pelvic splanchnics are gonna be hind gut. So if you know this, you can answer a lot of questions on the test. Okay, 
let's go into the anatomy. So remember the visceral peritoneum is gonna surround the organs, the parietal peritoneum, which is uh, somatically innervated, is gonna uh, uh, surround the abdominal cavity. We talk about the organs in reference to whether they're intraperitoneal or retroperitoneal. If they're completely surrounded by a mesentery, they're considered intraperitoneal. If they're only partially surrounded by it, they're called retroperitoneal. So definitely know the difference uh, between these. Uh, they do define it differently as secondary retroperitoneal. That means during development, it was once intraperitoneal uh, and then it moved towards the back. So it's only partially covered. So make sure you memorize these. The one that always gets me is the, um, um, the pancreas because uh, it's, uh, why is it, is it here? Where is it? The pancreas is technically retroperitoneal. Oh, because aren't, these aren't the secondary ones. Never mind, it's coming up. Uh, but it's, it's kind of lays in the middle. So I always forget whether it's inside or out, but it's retroperitoneal. So like I mentioned, the secondary retroperitoneal structure is one that was once originally completely surrounded by a mesentery but then uh, now is only partially. And you can see the pancreas is one of those. So definitely being able to define these is important too. This is from first aid. So if you remember this sad pucker, you can remember which ones are retroperitoneal. Uh, keep in mind that the, the ascending and descending colons um, are gonna be retroperitoneal, but the transverse peritoneum is intraperitoneal. So definitely know those. Okay. So when we look at this, I know the coverings kind of confuses, it confuses me at least. So if we look at this mid-sagittal section, this is the stomach here. So this is the greater sac, and then this would be the lesser sac right here. So, uh, um, so you can see here, this is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the greater omentum and the lesser omentum. So this would form the le greater sac, and then this would form the lesser sac. The question they like to ask is if you have some sort of ulceration that perf perforate, perforates in the stomach, depending on whether it's in the front or the back of the stomach, where is the blood going to collect? So if you have a lesion to the back, a perforation in the back of the stomach, it's gonna go into this lesser sac area. If it's in the front, it'll go into this greater sac. They also like to do um, pancreatic disease where that would show up in the lesser sac. Right, you can see the pancreas here. Okay, so again, this kind of outline lines it again. You can see that this greater omentum is going to be here, this lesser omentum here. So if, if you have any sort of blood coming out of stomach or fluid, whatnot, where is it going to go? The question they really like is when you have a, um, um, a posterior perforation, because that's common in the stomach, it's going to go into the lesser sac. Okay, so the omental foramen is kind of like this little access point. It, it allows any sort of fluid that's in the greater sac to go from to the lesser sac and vice versa. So you kind of want to know the, uh, the breakdown of where everything lies. One of the clinical correlations, because in this hepatoduodenal ligament, the, uh, the common bile duct, the hepatic artery, and the portal vein all travel in this. So if you need to stop blood flow to the, to the liver, you can actually press down on this ligament, okay? So that's called the Pringle maneuver. But we'll get into that in a little bit more detail coming up. Okay, and this just outlines it again. So this green here, you can see the greater sac. This blue is the lesser sac. You can see here if the patient was laying down supine, this is kind of the most dependent point, right? The lowest point. This is called the pouch of Morrison or the hepatorenal pouch, but uh, I have a slide coming up. And so that's where fluid's gonna collect if they're laying on their back. And then the pouch of Douglas, it's a female. Uh, yeah, it's a female. So um, you would expect, no, it's not. Yes, it is, no, it's not. Uh, okay. Yeah, so it, it's indecided, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so yeah, the pouch of Douglas will be around here or the retrovesicular pouch. She doesn't have a uterus or he doesn't have a uterus. So let's go with that. All right. Anyway, 
That um, definitely looks like a prostate. <laughs> it's a prostate, huh? All right. That looks like a prostate. <laughs> I see no vagina. All right, good. All right, or well, you know, anyway. All right, so any of the fluid that builds up, uh, it can actually travel from the upper part of the abdomen to the lower part through these pericolic gutters. Uh, it is something to note that this left pericolic gutter is narrower. So infections can flow down from the right side uh, easier. Okay. So yeah, the right side easier. Um, okay. We talked about the, um, the pouch of uh, pouch of Morrison or the hepatorenal pouch. So again, when the patient is laying down, if there's some sort of trauma, if you're expecting some sort of intra-abdominal bleeding, they can check that here. Now we could see definitively what's a female and what's a male. You could see the pouch of Douglas here. The fluid fluid's going to collect recto vesicular here in the man where the fluid's going to uh, collect when the patient is standing. Okay, so let's talk about this. In regards to the esophagus, you'll learn in histo how it breaks down, but basically the top is skeletal and the bottom is smooth. You would expect that the, the middle is kind of where they, uh, they, they cross over. So there are some important points where there are uh, constrictions and you can see that here, these constriction points. So you would expect the upper and the lower esophageal sphincter to be constriction points, but also the point at which the esophagus crosses by the arch of the aorta and also the uh, left main bronchus as well. Those are constriction points too. So when um, Dr. Bandolo goes into talking about the different, um, the well, y'all will get into it later, but they do this sort of mammography where they, they look at the different, uh, the different areas of the esophagus. But yeah, so you'll just wanna know that these different, these different points of where there's uh, constrictions. Okay, so for the arterial supply, remember that the celiac trunk comes off, there are three branches. You're gonna get this long uh, splenic artery that runs on top of the pancreas, it's very large. You get this left gastric that's gonna come to the lesser curvature. And then you're also going to get this common hepatic that's then going to branch off to the proper hepatic and the gastroduodenal. I have some pictures of some scans coming up that we can look at this because it does get a little confusing. Remember the right gastric is going to be on the lesser side. Um, the left or the right gastric comes around here, the left gastric here, and the gastroamentals are the ones that come uh, onto the greater curvature. Remember this splenic, this large one that comes off the celiac trunk is gonna go, you can see it behind here, um, right here and it goes to the spleen and it gives off these short gastrics as well up here. So this is from first aid. I like this because it kind of tells you where the blood is supplied from. So these short gastrics are gonna give over here to the fundus and then you could see uh, how it breaks down. Okay, we kind of talked about this perforated ulcer, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, we talked about it in regards to fluid, but if there's air that collects, if the patient is standing, the air that gets trapped in the abdominal ca cavity is gonna be caught up underneath, uh, uh, right up underneath the diaphragm, right above the liver, okay? That's where you're gonna get this uh, pneumo, um, or this, this air formation, uh, pneumoperi, Pneumoperitoneum, pneumoperitonitis, is it here? Something like that. Pneumoperitoneum, I think that's what it's called. I'll double check me on that one. Okay, another place we talked about the, um, the, uh, the, the front and the back of the stomach having preparations, but they also like to test their, about this first part of the duodenum. So remember that the stomach has a lot of acid that's gonna spill into the duodenum. So this is gonna be a, a, a point where ulcers can form when ulcers form there, remember that the gastroduodenal artery comes right behind it. So it can actually um, infil infiltrate the gastroduodenal artery. Also the branch, the superior, posterior superior pancreoduodenal artery comes up there too. So they like to test on that. If you had it, um, an ulceration or a perforation behind the first part or the duodenal bulb, um, what would that affect? And that gastroduodenal artery that comes behind there. So that's good to know as well. 
Oh, here we go. Yeah, it can invade the gastroduodenal artery. Okay, so small intestine, remember, once we go from the stomach, we're gonna go into the duodenum, into the jejunum, into the ileum. This is gonna be very important when you get to histology, they like to look at the differences there. We'll point out some differences coming up. Okay, and here they are, right? So remember the duodenum has four parts. Uh, it comes off the cap, it goes down, that's the second, it goes across the third and kind of up is the fourth. So you can look at these histologically or, or just here in these cartoons, you can see the duodenal cap, there's no plica formation right here. And these, these folds that go across like this, these are called plicae. And these are the similar lunar, lunar folds. You can see those here. The third part, what you're gonna remember, wanna remember here is that the third part runs down and the superior mesenteric vessels run over it. So if you have a, uh, an acute uh, um, angle of those vessels, it can actually cut this off. Uh, this is where you get that nutcracker syndrome as well under the superior mesenteric artery with the renal vein. So if it's bad enough, it could cut off um, it can cut off the bowel, but uh, typically we talk about it in regards to the renal vein. Uh, the fourth part, only thing you really want to remember is that it's that back portion of the, the uh, duodenum and it's attached by this ligament of treads. Now, when you get to the jejunum, what's classic about this when you look at these barium swallows, it, it has this feathery appearance. That's what they like to talk about, this feathery appearance that it, and that's because of all these uh, little packed circular folds here. And then once you get to the ilium, you see you don't see this feathery appearance anymore. It's more flattened. And one of the things you want to remember about the ilium is that they have Peyer's patches. This is, uh, these are secondary lymphoid tissue. So it actually helps with uh, develop, developing uh, uh, immu immunologically uh, some cells. But y'all get into that more next term. So just remember that these Peyer's patch help with uh, the immune system, and that's formed in the ileum. Okay, so now these these images do get a little confusing. Um, what I want to point out here is when you think of the superior mesenteric, uh, I think I have a, another picture when it goes to the large intestine, but remember the entire portion of the small intestine is going to be supplied by the superior mesenteric. If you imagine folding this up, then you could actually see uh, some of how the branching, or actually you could kind of appreciate it here, how it goes to the, the, uh, the colon. Now remember the, the superior mesenteric is gonna give all the blood supply up to the point of the, the last one third of the transverse colon. That's when the inferior mesenteric comes in. But if they give you a picture, we'll actually look at the, um, the barium swallows coming up. But just remember that in regards to the the small intestine that the superior mesenteric is what's gonna give off uh, the blood supply. Another thing to remember, the jejunum has these long vase erecta. Those are these right here, uh, they're coming off. So you can see these long vase erecta, whereas the ileum has shorter vase erecta. Okay, just in case they ask you that. Okay, and we kind of talked about the appendix, some things you wanna remember. You get this rebound ten tenderness. So when you lift off, they get this pain. So a sign is if you lift the lift their leg up to their chest, it causes pain when you have it. And then McBurney's point, which I'll know two thirds from the umbilicus and one third from the superior uh, iliac spine. So you could see here, uh, all this darkened area is a small bowel obstruction. The thing you wanna, you wanna incorporate here is this stack of coins appearance. And that's because of those plicae or those semilunar folds. And you could see those stack of coins. So you can identify this as small intestine. So cl the clinical signs, you would expect nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension, stuff like that. Okay, now we get to the large intense intestine. There's some definitive points here. The tinea coli are these little uh, points here that run in the middle. You'll see those histologically. And these hostra are these little segmentations here. You also have these little fatty appendages, these epiploic appendages uh, that form here that's specific to the large intestine as well. But when you look at these barium swallows, you can appreciate it because you see these different hostra and I'll point those out in a second. Now, again, when we get to the anal canal, the pectinate line is what we're gonna ask about. Anything below it is gonna be ectodermal, so somatic afferents. So, and anything above it is gonna be endodermal, so visceral afferents. So when in regards to hemorrhoids, which I have a slide coming up, 
uh, anything in external hemorrhoids that occur down here are gonna be very painful. And stuff that happens above, the hemorrhoids that happens above it are gonna be painless. So that's a good clinical correlate. Uh, as for the, uh, the um, yeah, so you would expect uh, constriction, relaxation, right? So you could defecate uh, parasympathetic. And then external anal sphincter, you would expect from the pudendal nerve because that's a somatic fiber. Internal anal sphincter, which is under um, autonomic control will be from sympathetics and parasympathetics. Again, below the pectinate line, you would expect the inferior rectal, which are under somatic control. Here is what I was talking about in regards to the hemorrhoids. Remember, anything above the pectinate line will be painless. Anything below it will be painful. So ectodermal versus endodermal. Visceral afferents above, somatic afferents below. Okay, so arterial supply. If they ask you a question about this, it'll probably be about the venous system because with the portal hypertension, you can get these um, pathological anastomoses here. But uh, you, you do wanna know that it does form anastomoses with the inferior rectal, the middle rectal and superior rectal. So I think knowing just kind of where they come from, superior rectal, inferior mesenteric, middle rectal, internal iliac, and inferior rectal down from the internal pudendal, that should be good enough there. Um, but in regards to uh, the venous drainage, you wanna remember, and we have a slide coming up, middle and inferior rectal and the superior rectal are gonna form these, uh, these anastomoses and you're gonna, that, that's gonna actually lead to hemorrhoid formation. And this is all due typically to portal hypertension. It's a backlog, but we'll get there in a second. Okay, same thing here. When we have this, we get these internal plexus and uh, with the portal hypertension, it could end up uh, giving you um, hemorrhoids, right? Like I said, and then just another thing along with the uh, innervation and the blood supply, lymphatics follow it as well. Above the pectinate line, go to internal iliacs. Below, go to, um, below, go to uh, the, the horizontal in, uh, inguinal lymph nodes. So it, internal hemorrhoids are above the pectinate line and external hemorrhoids are below the pectinate line. So you would expect the external hemorrhoids to be painful because that's somatic innervation, those somatic afferent fibers. Okay, diverticular. Uh, so we're gonna get to that in a second, Elvis. We're gonna talk about the different uh, anastomoses. So diverticulitis, diverticulosis, is these outpouchings. It's pretty common. Uh, usually it's not clinically significant until it gets infected. So osis is these little outpouchings that form. It can cause painless rectal bleeding, painless being the important part there. Uh, but once they get infected, you get this itis, itis meaning infection. So di diverticulitis is gonna be cause, uh, is gonna cause uh, this inflammation. So if these little outpouchings gets in, get infected, uh, then it could cause a lot of pain. Sigmoid volvulus, this is uh, an uh, emergency situation. So you get a twisting. Again, if you twist this tube, uh, you can't pass, uh, feces can't pass, and you're cutting off blood supply too. So this is, uh, this is a clinically significant because it's an emergency situation. You have to send them to surgery. And you can see here, they, they talk about this coffee bean appearance. So look, you see, if you have a blockage here in the sigmoid colon, nothing, none of this is gonna pass. None of this, this feces that's caught up is gonna be able to pass. And you're gonna also have a cut off of blood supply. You won't see any gas in the rectum, nothing over here, right? Because you're cutting off all the flow here. So it's often called this coffee bean sign. Okay, the important. Okay, this is what I wanted to talk about. So now imagine we've resected this the small intestine here. So uh, now we're just looking at the large intestine. So the superior mesenteric is going to give everything to the right side, all the way up until this the last one third of the transverse colon, which is right about here. Okay, everything from that point on is going to be inferior mesenteric. Okay. So I'll say it again, up until this point, everything prior to is gonna come from the superior mesenteric, right? And then everything from this point on is gonna be inferior mesenteric. Now, if you imagine we laid the small intestines over and it came over here, right? The superior mesenteric is gonna give blood supply to that small intestine over here. But we're just looking at the large intestine. What they like to test about is this marginal artery, which goes across. 
So this, as you could tell, look at the, if you had to say one area that's not getting a lot of blood supply, you'd say this area, this is that splenic flexure. So the, the way it's able to get blood supply is through these marginal arteries. It's like a, those side roads uh, next to the interstate, right? So you, you can get blood to, uh, to this area. And if there's some sort of occlusion somewhere, these marginal arteries are gonna be this little track that you get blood. So a lot of times they talk about this splenic flexure, this watershed area, how does it get blood? Well, it gets it from these marginal arteries that run across. Okay, the thing I wanna point out here is that, cause we had this on our lab exam, the venous drainage, okay, so anything from the, the gut is gonna be considered portal drainage. And anything that's portal draining, you need to get it to the liver so that it can be detoxified. So anything you eat, anything that gets processed in the gut that gets to the blood, you need to get it to the liver. So that's the portal system. Uh, venous drainage from the limbs that doesn't need to be detoxified is gonna go through the cable system, okay? So you can see here all of this, the inferior mesenteric, the superior mesenteric, the splenic, everything's gonna drain into the portal vein. The question we had, it was pointing to the superior mesenteric and it was hard to identify, well, is it superior or inferior? Remember, before we get to this portal vein, the splenic and the inferior mesenteric join together. And then this splenic inferior mesenteric combo here joins with the superior mesenteric and they make the portal vein. Okay, so I, I believe I have a picture coming up with, uh, with the scan and we can look at that again, but um, just remember that these combine here and then the super mesenteric comes in. Okay, uh, not too much on lymph nodes, lymph drainage, nobody likes that. But if you wanted to know uh, the drainage of the gut, the typically the, the, the point where they all come together is this uh, cisterna chile. So it comes here and it, it can drain into the thoracic duct. Okay, so if we look at the, the liver, remember this falciform ligament, which uh, kind of it connects to the umbilicus. It's like the, the remnant from the umbilicus, uh, right lobe, left lobe. It's actually broken up uh, very nicely into like I think eight different segments. So if there is some sort of tumor formation, you can actually resect part of the liver and it has all of its own, these eight segments have its own um, uh, vasculature. So you can, you can cut them up. Uh, independently. This is the caudate lobe, and then this middle one is the quadrate. I remember the quadrates on the bottom and quad like, uh, like a square. It's a square on the bottom and then the caudates on top, and you can see the gallbladder behind it. Um, and we talked about this briefly. Remember this porta hepatis, that is going to be what is uh, inside that gastroduodenal ligament, and it's going to contain this porta. It's, the gastroduodenal ligament will contain the porta hepatis, which has three components to it common hepatic duct, which is gonna be draining the, the um, bile from the liver, which y'all will get into in detail later. You'll also have the proper hepatic artery, which will be um, bringing oxygenated blood into the liver and also the portal vein, which will be bringing de uh, deoxygenated blood that needs to be detoxified from the gut. Okay, so that's super important. And remember when, when these are right, right there in that gastroduodenal ligament, that's where you can press down for that Pringle maneuver to stop the blood flow, okay? And you're basically pressing on this system when you do that. All right, and like I said, the hepatic artery is gonna give 30%. That's gonna be your oxygenated blood that obviously the liver is gonna need oxygen. And then the portal vein is 70%. That's the, the deoxygenated that needs to be detoxified. Okay, and then we look here, this is gonna be important too. Remember the duct structure. So the right and left hepatic ducts are gonna be draining from the liver. Common uh, hepatic duct is once they join together. Then the gallbladder and the cystic duct is gonna join the common hepatic duct to make the bile duct. And then it's gonna come all the way down here and it's gonna join the, the, uh, the pancreatic duct at the, uh, they call it the ampulla veda. That's this point right here and it's gonna drain into this papilla. Remember, this is the second part of the duodenum. Now, what I wanna point out here is uh, a lot of times they'll give you some sort of blockage. I think I have a picture coming up, but this is a good point for it anyway. Um, depending on the lab values, you can tell where the blockage is. So if you had a blockage here, you, would, um, you can say, well, they'll probably the GGT and the ALP will be elevated because it's limited to the gallbladder. Let's say we had a blockage 
here, or well, let's do it up here in the hepatic duct. So you would expect the ALT and AST to be elevated. If you had a blockage here, you would expect the AST, ALT, ALP, and GGT to be elevated, right? Because you're including the, the gallbladder and the, uh, the uh, liver. If you had a blockage here, you're preventing uh, bile flow from the gallbladder, from the liver, and from the pancreas. So you, along with those, you would expect the amylase and lipase to be elevated. So depending on which lab values are, are increased, you can tell exactly where the blockage is. This is from first aid. It just kind of has a, a nice little diagram here. Um, and I have, I think I have a blown up picture of this. You can see this uh, retrograde endoscopy that they do. Yeah, so again, right. So what they talk about, they like to say, uh, you, someone eats a fatty meal and they get this colicky right upper quadrant pain, right? And that's typically caused uh, by these gallstones. Uh, the, the mnemonic they like to use, fat, fertile, female and 40. Those, that's typically your patient presentation for these, these stones. So again, depending on where the stone is lodged, you're gonna look at those lab values uh, and see this, uh, the CMP or the metabolic panel to see what's elevated. And uh, if, it, if this pain uh, ends up with some sort of uh, infection or inflammation, remember that's gonna be inflammation, uh, you're gonna, you can get uh, acute cholecystitis. And y'all get into this more uh, Y'all get into bile. Dr. Trotz teach y'all all about bile and all this. So, um, for right now, just kind of remember the an the anatomy behind it. Okay, yeah. So uh, um, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, right? So you can see this little. This is the tube right here. They get it right into the duodenum, right into that papilla, squirted up the ampulla vader, and you could see this is going to the pancreas. F is pancreas, and then um, this is gonna be your, uh, your bile duct, uh, yeah, your common bile duct. You see D is going to the gallbladder, that's your cystic duct, your common hepatic duct, and then A and B are splitting to right and left hepatic ducts going into the liver. So you could see that all, they, they can do this to see if there's some sort of blockage. Um, yeah, um, oh, y'all haven't learned the labs? Okay, yeah, so y'all will get to that. Dr. Trotz will teach y'all about that. But just remember, when y'all get to the labs, think of it in relation to gallstones. It'll help you to determine where the blockage is. Y'all will get there. Um, so yeah, so you can see everything's patent here. You would expect everything, but this is a good image to understand to see the, the bile duct flow. Okay, uh, just in case, this is more of like a surgical uh, point. You can see this triangle of Callot, uh, the liver, the, the cystic duct and con, uh, common hepatic duct make it up. And if you see in the middle of it, this cystic artery kind of runs in between this triangle. I think y'all did actually learn those um, lab values in FTM, um, but y'all are gonna learn them again uh, prior to the test. Okay, and remember we said that the, um, the splenic artery that's going to come off of the celiac trunk is going to travel right along the top of the pancreas and get to the spleen. So it's going to be, uh, yeah, right, exactly, yeah. Y'all learned it with the troponins, yeah, exactly, yeah. But y'all are going to do it again, so don't, don't stress about it. So the spleen's going to get a lot of blood supply because the, the spleen does a lot with um, getting rid of um, old red blood cells and white blood cells too. So it has a heavy blood supply, but it runs on top of the pancreas. And then obviously, uh, because of where it is, where it lies, oh, that's on the left side, um, it, when you get hit in the side, you can actually get splenic rupture. You get tremendous amounts of intraperitoneal bleeding just because the spleen, uh, I think it, it stores like a third or a fourth of your blood in your body. It's like ridiculous, way more than you'd think. And if there's some sort of disease such as, um, Sickle cell, you can get splenomegaly, and that's just because of all those old red blood cells that get caught up, or, or the de uh, defective red blood cells that get caught up. Okay, so let's talk about this portal system. Again, remember I said that this inferior mesenteric is going to join the splenic, and then it's going to join the superior mesenteric, then into the portal system. Portal vein is going to go to the liver, and it is going to detoxify all of that deoxygenated blood that is coming from the gut. Okay. So yeah, let's look at these. These are super important. They got a star. So we're gonna talk about these um, 
the esophagus. So what happens here is you have portal hypertension. So typically the patient has cirrhosis, right? So the blood that's going into the liver, it, it can't go anywhere because the, the, the cirrhotic, it's like dead tissue. It's very uh, fibrous and it's very hard tissue. So the blood can't get in there. So you end up getting a backlog of blood. So you get this portal hypertension. So the only way that these this blood can go is through these backflow channels of different anastomoses. So over time with this, uh, you end up getting these pathologic uh, anastomoses, which are these formation of these vessels. And they're very clinically significant to identify one, you have portal hypertension, two, you probably have cirrhosis of the liver. Okay, so one they talk about is the esophageal anastomosis. So what happens is you get portal hypertension, you get blood flow to the left gastric backflow. So it's important to know that the purple is the portal system. Remember that's the detoxify or that's the system that needs to be detoxified. Cable system is like from the limb, so it doesn't. So you don't want portal blood that needs to be detoxified, not getting detoxified. But what happens is because of the portal hypertension, the only way to send it is into the cable system. Right, so it's not good, it's not getting detoxified. So one of these system, these esophageal tributaries go into the left gastric vein. And then from there, instead of going to the liver to be detoxified, they go to these connections to these uh, to the azygous and hemiazygous vein. So then you get esophageal varices. What they'll, what they'll tell you is the patient is coughing up blood. Um, uh, and so, so hematemesis, hematemesis, yes. So coughing up blood. Um, so you get these varices here. Oh yeah, it's right here. Um, and uh, and that's the problem because they're very fragile veins. And if they if you look at through a scope, you could see they're very torturous veins uh, in there. And that's because of this backlog. So you also can get these like we talked about through this superior rectal vein. It's going to drain into the cable system, which is inferior and middle rectal vein, and then you're going to get hemorrhoid formation. Again, these will these will bleed as well. It's not supposed to be. Uh, it's not supposed to be there. They're not very. They're very fragile, and the whole point is that you're getting this backlog of flow, this portal hypertension. So you have to push it somewhere. The other one they talk about, y'all probably heard of the caput medusa. If you remember medusa with the uh, the snakes. Um, from mythology. So uh, you get this, um, this, uh, the, these veins that form on the stomach around the uh, umbilicus. So they start paraumbilical. These are supposed, these are portal. They're supposed to go to the, to the liver to be detoxified. There's portal hypertension. So the only play they can, place they can go is to the inferior epigastrics. So make sure you have these in your head. If there's a problem like caput medusa, you're going paraumbilical to the epigastric veins. That's your cable system, right? And then from there, these superficial epigastric veins are gonna form the caput medusa, right? So these are gonna be pretty easy if you remember these different, um, these different pathways. Uh, they don't really talk about this too much in the bare area of the liver. Um, I would definitely know one, two, and three for sure. Uh, Okay, now the pancreas, remember I did mention, this is that first part of the duodenum. So a lot of acid gets in there. So you can get perforations, you can get ulcerations. If you get one to the posterior aspect, you see here the celiac trunk, the proper hepatic, and then this is the gastroduodenum. It runs behind that first part of the duodenum. So if you get a perfor perforation to the posterior part, this cap, the duodenal bulb, it can infiltrate this gastroduodenal artery. Now. This is an anastomosis here because from the gastroduodenal, you get the, uh, the su posterior superior pancreato pancreatic, uh, and that could gives rise, um, that, that supplies blood to the head of the pancreas. And then, um, yeah, and to the eucinate process, which is that little part too. But they also get blood supply here that goes up. So there is an anastomosis there. Okay, and then we talked about the bile. Uh, remember that it's going to, this is gonna be your bile duct and this is gonna be your pancreatic duct. That's the ampulla vader. It's gonna drain right into this papilla. Remember, this is the second part of the duodenum. If they talk about someone who has uh, vomitus and it's non-bile stained, that means it, it's from here and above. It's bile stained. 
that means the bile leaked in here and the vomit is coming up through here. And that's why there's bile in it. So they like to, they like to ask that question because it tests your anatomy. Um, here's the, the good anastomoses from, uh, from the pancreas, right? So you get one from here, uh, from the celiac trunk, to, from the gastroduodenal, to the posterior superior pancreoduodenal, but you also get these uh, from the superior mesenteric artery coming up and above. So uh, just keep those in mind because those will supply the pancreas or the head of the pancreas specifically. Another good landmark, if they give you an, a picture, that splenic artery is very large and it runs above the pancreas, okay, all the way. And that's again, because uh, the spleen needs a lot of, a lot of blood flow. Okay, um, I think that's good. You can see that cystic duct, the hepatic duct, uh, the common bile duct is gonna drain into the second part of the duodenum. All right, and some clinical correlations. Um, you can get rupture of the pancreas. Rupture of the spleen is much more common. Pancreatic cancer, um, usually when it presents, it's really late. Uh, it's like stage four. It doesn't have a really good prognosis. But again, you're gonna wanna look at those, um, those pancreatic enzymes, amylase and lipase, and you, could, you can detect that. Sometimes a uh, tumor in the head of the pancreas can affect the blood flow. I'm sorry, the, the bile flow, probably the blood flow too. But what we're talking about here is the bile flow, right? Because that duodenal papilla is right there. So you can see that as well. Okay, so let's break this down. Um, so I would say the celiac trunk is probably right about here. Okay, so remember it has three branches. You can't see the, the left gastric coming up here. So that's one. Then you have the common hepatic is two. Four is gonna be that large splenic that's coming across. So imagine the pancreas is somewhere around here. Five is just gonna be that renal that comes directly off the superior mesenteric. So if we go from two, right? For, so celiac trunk, two is gonna be the common hepatic. Then we're gonna, one is gonna be proper hepatic. Remember it branches there. Three is gonna be the gastroduodenal. Okay, so these are some things you're gonna to wanna to be able to identify on a scan here. It looks like it's a retrograde scan. They, they, they put the, two, the uh, line in here and they shot it up retrograde. So you can see it all light up. Okay, yeah, I think that covers it. Yeah, good. Okay, this is a barium swallow. You can see here the stomach is all lit up with the, the barium. You can see that it comes across here. This is the pylorus. And then you can see the duodenal cap and this part of the duodenum. This is the second part, third part of the duodenum here. So it's gonna be good if just take a few minutes, just kind of orient yourself with these slides and you should be good. Remember we talked about the jejunum. This is again a barium swallow. The jejunum has this feathery appearance. So I remember a question like this, I think it might've been on our lab exam, but remember the jejunum is gonna have this feathery appearance. The ilium doesn't have those, uh, those semicircular folds. So it's not gonna have that feathery appearance, so you can identify it there. Remember the large intestine, remember we can identify that by these hostra. These are these segmentations. These are all separate hostra. Um, so you can see that here and you could see the cecum. So small intestine goes to the cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, that splenic flexure, descending colon, and um, yeah, right. So, Okay, this is where I, I wanted to point out. Remember when we talked about the superior mesenteric artery. So it may be confusing because when you think of superior mesenteric, you're thinking it needs to go to the right side of the body, right? So that's right in regards to the large intestine. So one, two, and three are all gonna be giving off to the large intestine, the ileocolic, the right colic, and the middle colic. But four and five are giving off blood to the small intestine. Okay, so these are gonna be your jejunal and your ileal branches. So if you get this image, don't freak out and be like, wait, it's supposed to be separated, you know, because the, the uh, superior mesenteric is gonna give off to the right side for the large intestine, but it also has those small intestine branches. Now, this was what you would get it confused with, because, but remember, the inferior mesenteric is gonna give off to the left side, but it's just that distal, that, le that last one third of the transverse colon and the, dis, uh, the descending colon, okay? So you can see the difference here, superior mesenteric versus inferior mesenteric, but I would definitely know those. All right, so let's just orient ourselves. Remember the big livers on the right, this CT scan, the bones are lit up. 
This is the stomach. That means what's between them is the lesser sac. So a perforation here to the posterior part of the stomach would drain into the lesser sac. Uh, you can see this is probably some sort of intestine because uh, it's, it's hollow, it's black. You could see here as we go down the celiac trunk part of the pancreas, again, the liver is going to be on the right. You see the large spleen. You can actually appreciate the uh, splenic artery that's running on top of the pancreas that's going all the way to the spleen here. Uh, this is the descending aorta here. That's probably the superior mesenteric or inferior mesenteric artery right, right here. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, inferior vena cava. Yeah, it's very large. So superior mesenteric is coming off of the aorta. Uh, inferior vena cava is here. You can see this dark portion uh, it kind of embedded in the liver is going to be the gallbladder. So just take a few minutes and orient yourself with these. Remember right and left. When you do these, I'm sure you've heard already, you always imagine the patient's feet are going to hit you in the face. Okay, so they're laying down and their feet are in, the, in your face. So that's why it's oriented this way. It's always like that. Okay, again, this is that picture I was telling y'all about. You can't really see that inferior mesenteric artery, but just know that it's joining up with that splenic. That's, I'm sorry, these are the vein, the splenic vein, inferior mesenteric. Um, okay, that is the inferior mesenteric artery, but just remember that the vein's gonna travel with it. The inferior mesenteric vein is gonna uh, combine with the splenic, and then this is the superior mesenteric vein. Uh, we had a question like this on our lab as well. So this point right here is where, where the, the splenic and inferior mesenteric vein join the superior mesenteric vein to make the portal there. All right, and lastly, we'll talk about glycogen real quick. So if we use our light switches, remember when insulin is active, we're gonna be able to break down glucose and um, and make glycogen for storage form. And the opposite is also true uh, when you need to make glucose and insulin is off when you're in the fasting state. Uh, gluconeogenesis and glycogen, glycogen degradation are active. Lindsay pointed that, this out. This is a super important slide. Remember these three steps, they're unidirectional. Um, so they're gonna push one way and uh, they're gonna push towards glycolysis and the gluconeogenesis, these four enzymes are super important, are gonna push you towards um, making glucose, increasing your blood glucose. Lindsay also talked about hexokinase versus glucokinase. Remember in, in the liver, I'm sorry, in the muscle, you wanna have, you wanna have uh, low KM, which is inversely proportional to your affinity. So low KM means high affinity because in the muscle, you wanna grab all the glucose as possible. Whereas in the liver, you have high glucose, so you want to increase capacity, so a high Vmax. That's how I remember it. Uh, so yeah, you can keep that straight. Okay, so when we talk about glycogen, remember, you're going to want to, glycogen is your storage form of glucose. So you want to, you're going to want to degrade glycogen to increase your blood glucose. So we talk about glycogen and gluconeogenesis kind of simultaneously, but what actually happens is in the first 24 hours of fasting, you're going to use up all your glycogen stores, which makes sense. You're going to use your stores before you start making new like uh, glucose. So you're going to use your glycogen stores. And then after about 24 hours, then you start with gluconeogenesis and making new glucose. Okay. Again. Yeah. So the whole goal here is to increase blood glucose. A little caveat to, to know is that, um, Obviously in the liver, you're gonna to wanna to increase your blood glucose, but once you mobilize the glucose and get it to your muscles, that's when you're actually gonna be breaking it down. So any glucose in the muscles is actually gonna be broken down to glycolysis. It's the liver's job to get it increased in the blood. Now we talked about uh, this, this is a little confusing. You just kind of have to work it out. But remember the phosphorylated form of them is gonna be on the glycogen team, right? So this is off. So we're going to be phosphorylated, glycogen's active. And uh, so you're going to be degrading it. So phosphorylation, you phosphorylate the kinase to activate it. The kinase will phosphorylate glycogen phosphorylase to activate it as well. Thus, you'll be able to break down glycogen. You want to do practice problems with these because they're going to give you a lot of different steps and you're going to have to work these out. So make sure you have who's on whose team, to know everything. Glycogen synthase obviously is on insulin's team 
because we want to store it. The phosphorylases, kinase and phosphorylase, you're trying to uh, break down the glycogen. Okay, epinephrine, you would imagine, is on glycogen's team, or um, yeah, glycogen's team, because when you're running from a bear, you want to have as much uh, blood glucose as possible. Okay, so again, where uh, epinephrine will have the effect of phosphorylating the phosphorylase kinase, which will kinase will phosphorylate glycogen phosphorylase. It may be important to know that some of these uh, these um, these factors. Um, so calcium is going to be one of the things, especially in the muscle that you're going to use. Uh, AMP is uh, going to be used for glycogen phosphorylase. Now, obviously, in the muscle. Question. Yes. I thought epinephrine was on glucagon side because you're talking about glycogen degradation. Glucagon. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I might have said glycogen. Glucagon's tea. Yes. You're you're gonna try to uh, make it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Glucagon's team. Sorry about that. Um, in regards to the questions, I posted everything I have on my drive. There's like a bunch of, uh, there's like a Mac Daddy question set that has like 700 questions if y'all want to do those. Um, I think I posted the SNL practice questions too. And they will give y'all a lot of questions on Sakai uh, going forward. So as many as you can, just to make sure you don't get these mixed up because it's very easily done. Now, any sort of glycogen stores in the muscles, you're gonna be able to break it down and use, uh, use it as ATP directly. So when we look here, um, so glycogen phosphor, uh, right, so glucose in the liver will inhib inhibit glycogen phosphorylase, right? Because you don't need to make more glucose if you have, uh, you don't need glycogen phosphorylase to make glucose if you already have glucose. So it's, uh, it's like a feedback inhibition. Um, muscle uh, AMP would activate glycogen phosphorylase. Why do you think so? Because AMP means you need more energy. You wanna make ATP. So you're gonna activate glycogen phosphorylase to break down glycogen so that you can use it for energy. So use whatever you can think to understand these is instead of just memorizing, it makes sense if you have glucose you could feed back to not make more glucose. If you have AMP, you could feed forward to make more ATP. All right, and then this clinical correlation, this MODI type two, it's a deficiency of glucokinase. Where does glucokinase work? In the liver. So it's a liver problem. Uh, it's uh, maturity onset diabetes of young type two. So it presents very similarly to uh, type one diabetes, uh, impaired insulin secretion from beta cells. So just in case they ask that, if anything, I'd say, make sure you know that MODI2 is related directly to glucokinase. All right, so think about glycogen. Storage form, so you take these glucose molecules and you, you, you kind of hook them up on a string. And these are one, four bonds um, that are gonna form. So these, uh, so you're hooking the one carbon to the four carbon and you're making these long strings. So I think I have a better picture coming up. Um, okay, well, first off, let's go with this. Largest amount is gonna be formed in, is found in skeletal muscle. That's because you can just use it directly in the muscle. Um, uh, oh, I just wanted to say that, uh, yeah. So in glu uh, uh, glycogen synthase is the regulated enzyme in making glycogen. That's good, right? You'd want the one that's actually the synthase that's synthesizing glycogen to be the regulated step. Um, the slide's coming up, hold on, I'll, I'll get into the, the formation of glycogen in a second. And then again, when you're degrading it, um, whether it's in the liver is different from the muscle, right? Remember we talked about uh, that the liver, that glucose can feed back on the liver, but also there is some, this hormonal activation. So there's a little bit of difference here that glucagon and epinephrine, remember we talked about in, uh, ER, how epinephrine and cortisol can relate to increasing blood glucose. So this is more of a direct effect. And always muscle is gonna be AMP. Calcium has to do with muscle as well, muscle contraction. So calcium and the need for more ATP uh, is gonna be in the muscles. But keep in mind, it's independent of hormones in the muscle. Liver is gonna be uh, correlated with the hormones. Okay, and this is just more of the same. Remember, we're off, so we're, we're on the glucagon team. Uh, we're gonna be trying to increase our blood glucose. So the phosphorylation is active. 
in these steps by phosphorylating these, you're activating them. So you're able to degrade uh, glycogen. Uh, kinase is gonna phosphorylate the phosphorylase and then you can push towards gluconeogenesis, okay? Here's more of the same. Remember we said insulin is dephosphorylated. That means it's on. So these are your players on the team here, right? The, when these are on, they're dephosphorylated. Oh, Vanessa had a great point. Um, uh, when this is uh, on, up, uh, on means D, right? So the, the arrow, the D is up, so right? So it's on, so we're dephosphorylated, right? And then glucagon is off, so it's the phosphorylated phase. So that means the P is uh, for phosphorylated and insulin is D, so there we go. All right, and again here, uh, the glucose, when we're breaking it down, again, these are our players here that are gonna break it down. And um, when it's off, the glucose is gonna, uh, you're gonna be, um, making new glucose. So they did a good job with the um, like going over, they go over it a number of times, these pathways to kind of bring it all together for y'all. So just remember who's the team. So insulin's team, remember they're gonna be dephosphorylated and then uh, glucagon's team is gonna be the phosphorylated phase. Okay, here's what I was gonna say about glycogen. So you're gonna make linear chains. You're gonna make these really long chains of one, four bonds and then you're gonna branch them out. By branching them, you're kind of making it more compact. You don't have these long linear change. You have a compact form of it. Um, and glycogen is your core protein in the middle. So glycogen, in, and so you can see here these long chains, these alpha one, four, so one, the one carbon to the four carbon, but the branch parts are one, six. I'm bringing this up because the glycogen storage diseases correlate with this as well. So uh, amylopectin is these longer chains and then glycogen, once you make these one, six branch points, it makes it more compact where how you want it to be. Okay, so we wanna talk about these cause these are really clinically significant. This is the last part I promise and then we're done. Um, so you wanna know what the diseases are and what the deficiency is and how they present. So we're gonna go through these. So we kind of talked about this. This is from first aid, if you wanna kind of see how it breaks down. And then this is also from first aid if, if you wanna see a little bit more uh, detailed. Now, the thing to remember, von Kirk's is very, it's a severe disease. So what you're gonna see is it's normal structure. So you do, you, uh, you do have glycogen, you just can't break it down to make new glucose. So you're gonna have this normal structure of glycogen, but uh, you, because of this glucose 6-phosphatase deficiency, you can't take the glycogen and break it all the way into glucose, okay? So you get this, uh, these large stores. Now, what you wanna keep in mind is that because you have uh, high glycogen stores in the liver and the cortex of the kidney, you're gonna see enlargement of the liver and the kidney. This is very classic for von Gerg's disease. They talk about hepatomegaly and nephromegaly. If you see that, see a young child, uh, it's probably gonna be von Gerg's. So what you see, and this is because <clears throat> they can't make glucose from their stores. They have stores, they just can't make it. So you get severe hypoglycemia between meals, right? When they're eating meals, they're fine. They have enough blood glucose, but when they're in a fasting state, they can't mobilize their glycogen stores to make glucose. So you get severe hypoglycemia. You also get lactic acidosis. And this is important because by not making, by not being able to uh, make the glucose, you're, you're forcing the system into the anaerobic pathway, right? The lactate from the blood cannot be used for gluconeogenesis, okay? And that has to do with this deficiency as well. So keep that in mind, severe uh, hypoglycemia and also lactic acidosis. Okay, um, Pompe's disease, I remember Pomp, Pompe sounds like pump, so it affects the heart. So this is a deficiency specifically in the lysosomes. It's an alpha 1,4, so those linear chains, glucosidase, or it's also known as S and maltase. Um, it's also classified as a lysosomal storage disease. But I just remember it sounds like pump, 
So when they talk about cardiomegaly, uh, Pompe sounds like pump. Now, again, you're gonna have normal glycogen structures, okay? This is important and I'll point that out in a second and normal uh, blood glucose levels. But whenever they talk about cardiomegaly, uh, you can think of uh, Pompe. Okay, now we're gonna get into the point where you have a problem with the branch points or the debranching points, okay? So Corey's disease is type three and it's a debranching problem. So we're having a problem breaking down the glycogen, right? We're having a problem debranching it. We've already made the branches. We've already made glycogen. We can't debranch it. So specifically this 4-4 transferase where you're taking these little structures and you're putting it back on the linear chain or this 1-6 glucosidase where you, you have a problem eating these. It's kind of like Pac-Man, just kind of chewing these up. You have a problem with that. So this is the debranching problem. Now, the the thing you're gonna see here is you have an abnormal uh, uh, structure of glycogen. And that's because when you get to this point, you have these limit dextrins where, where you can't debranch them. Ideally, you would take these and put these on the linear branch and then you could just chew them up like Pac-Man, but you can't because of the, you can't debranch it. These are called limit dextrins or limit, de limit dextrinosis, but this is gonna form a, um, this is gonna form abnormal glycogen. So if you see abnormal glycogen, you're thinking Corey's disease or Addison's disease. Uh, and that's because of this. Now, that being said, um, uh, so yeah, so Corey's disease here, you could see it's not as severe as von Gerke's disease, but uh, remember you have these um, abnormal glycogens. Addison's, is, I'm sorry, Anderson's disease is a problem with the, um, yeah, let me go back. Okay, so the limit dextrins. Okay, so once you get to this point right here, it's the job of these, okay, it's the job of the 4-4 transferase to take these three, these blue ones, and put it on this chain, okay? Once you're breaking down glycogen, because Pac-Man can't eat these. He needs to eat them in the red chain, like a, a linear chain. So you once you- the deck, like, the, like, why do we get the dextrin and then how does it, can you explain that? Okay, so think of, this, think of this as the normal glycogen chain, okay? So you you get to a point like here where you're chewing these up, right? So you, you can chew these up, but once you get to this point, the enzyme's too big and it can't keep chewing. So what it does is it takes these and puts them on the end of the long chain. Okay, and once it's on the end of the long chain, then Pac-Man could come and chew them up. So the job of these to take it from the branch pattern to the linear pattern is this 4-4 transferase, okay? And, the, and also this 1-6 glucosidase. Typically it's the 4-4 transferase we talk about because it's taking this 4-4 this bond and it's transferring it to this 1-4 uh, this linkage, okay? The enzyme just can't chew it up like this. It needs to chew it up in linear chains. This, the only reason they branch it like this is because it's com compact formation of it. But once you get it on the linear chains, then you could chew it up. So the problem here is that you can't take this, you can't debranch it, right? It's already branched, so you can't debranch it. You can't put it and make it linear. And then, so you can't chew it up. So, um, and we could talk about it in regards to Anderson disease too. So here we have a problem with uh, the branching, glycogen branching enzyme. So again, this is going to be abnormal glycogen, but they're going to be all in long chains. So where Corey's disease, we had a problem breaking down the glycogen, or like, or you know, so we because it was debranching. Here we have a problem forming normal glycogen because we can't branch it, okay? So you're gonna have long uh, linear one, four bonds, but you're not gonna have those one, six bonds. And that's because the enzyme at, at effect here is this four, six transferase. It's gonna take these one, four bonds, move them over and make it a one, six bond to make it branch, but it can't. So the abnormal glycogen you would expect here, and they can put in the, in the stem of the question, is you have these long glycogen chains. Why do you have long glycogen chains? Because you can't branch them. So it's Anderson's disease. 
the key word you want to keep in mind here is they talk about infantile cirrhosis. So both Corey's and Anderson's are going to have abnormal glycogen. Corey's problem, you can't debranch it. Anderson's problems, you can't branch it. Okay, McArdle's disease, remember McArdle's, remember that for muscle. This is only gonna be in the muscle isozyme form, the liver spine. So what you'll see clinically is they get rhabdomyolysis or uh, muscle breakdown, cellular muscle breakdown, lysing of the cells in the muscle. So uh, typically after forced exercise, so you would expect the CKMM, which is the muscle isotype to be increased. Now, one of the things you wanna keep in mind that they'll put in the stem is they, after strenuous exercise, they'll get muscle weakness, but the lactate does not increase, okay? And that's just because that the lactate, uh, it's normally increasing in the blood, but with the glycogen degradation, uh, you, you can't actually um, make the lactate from anaerobic glycolysis. So the idea is that you, you bring the glycogen, you need to get it to that uh, glucose 6-phosphate form before you get it to the anaerobic glycolysis, but you can't even shuttle it from the glycogen form because it has to basically get to the glycolysis pathway before it can get to lactate, but we can't even get to that point with McArdle's. Um, HERS disease, remember H, HERS is for hepatic, and so this is going to be, so you would expect the muscle isozyme to be normal, and you're going to have a problem with hepatic phosphorylase, okay, so you would expect liver problems. Teruri disease is very similar to McArdle's, except you are adding the hemolysis. So it's specifically a problem with PFK1 deficiency in red blood cells. So you're going to get uh, cramping and similar symptoms to McArdle's disease, but you also add the hemolysis. So if they talk about hemolysis due to, the, due to that stress on the system, um, you're talking about Teruri's disease. And then this is something uh, that was there, just kind of outlining the whole process if you want to look into that. And that is it. That is all we have for you guys. So I hope that wasn't too much. Um, if y'all have any questions, by all means, we can stay and, and try to uh, try to help.